So guys what if Naruto got connected lover starting with Kami special movie? Amaterasu had the chance to do many things in her immortal life, not everything she did was right, but she tried her best to stay on the path of a benevolent ruler, she learned quickly that not even a goddess was immune to errors in judgment, there were times when she wanted to blame the power she held, but the raven-haired goddess knew the fault started and ended with her. Contrary to the overwhelming amount of tales about her shining splendor, these days, Amaterasu only remembered her failings, inevitably, the goddess thought about her family, she thought they'd be together forever, after all, they were a clan of immortal deities, they fought, bickered, and held grudges some more than others, but the sun goddess always believed there would be time to reconcile. That sentiment was shattered when her brother, Sukuyomi, faded, the losses didn't stop there as one after the other, her subjects were lost, humanity left them behind in their drive for power, and it was poetic that as the Shinto leader, she survived the longest to live with the guilt of her failures. During this period of solitude, Amaterasu did the unthinkable, she took her dwindling power and turned it into a miracle, a child, doing so cost her a tremendous amount of her life force, but Amaterasu didn't care. When most gods and goddesses were born, they came out with fully developed bodies, however, Amaterasu wanted to carry her child before she departed this world. The rigors of pregnancy were rough on her weak body, but the solar deity cherished the process, she carried her baby for an entire year to make sure he came out strong and healthy, and for the first time in over a century, Amaterasu wasn't alone, she had a son, Naruto. On cue, the cry of her baby Godaling broke the pensive peace Amaterasu was sitting in, Naruto's cry traded the past for the present in a flash, swaying with the babe in her arms, Amaterasu shone with motherly pride as she smiled at her precious child, shish, my sunshine, don't spend your tears, Ka-chan is right here. The familiar sound of his mother's soothing voice got Naruto to open his eyes, with the appearance of his golden orbs came an innocent warmth, Naruto could look at her a million times, and Amaterasu's heart would soar a million times, one look is all it took for her baby to cement his place as the most important person in her life, past or present. Amaterasu held her emotions together until her baby boy reached out with his tiny hands, it ended up being her who was crying as she offered a finger to Naruto's chubby hands, my sunshine, I love you more than words can explain, if only I could watch you grow into the wonderful man I know you'll be. There was no escaping that she was fading like her family before her, it was only her tremendous power that kept Amaterasu alive this long, her number one goal with the time she had left was securing a future for her son. Thankfully she found a family suitable for her child, a woman named Uzumaki Kashina and her husband Namikaze Minato would make excellent parents in her stead. But this knowledge didn't quell the pain in Amaterasu's heart, the only thing that could lift her spirits was Naruto's soft smile, when he did that, suddenly the pain wasn't so bad, kissing Naruto tenderly on his forehead, the misty-eyed mother laid her forehead against a giggling Naruto. Congratulations on the birth of your son, Amaterasu Omikami. Reacting to the uninvited voice, Amaterasu released a ripple of divine power, the wave of divinity swept across the room, igniting every available surface with pitch black flames, who dare invades her holy ire and fire flickered out when the maternal goddess saw who she was speaking with. First, she checked on Naruto, who appeared hardly bothered, the only thing her flare of power did was make his eyes glow, otherwise, the babe seemed unaffected by her explosive reaction, chaos. What are you doing here? Chaos created all things, this included the universe Amaterasu called home, it was well known that anyone and everyone feared chaos anger. However, Amaterasu never expected chaos of all entities to show up in Takamagahara, truthfully, this was only the second time Amaterasu met chaos and the first time seeing chaos in a physical form. Chaos chose a feminine form for herself with purple hair so dark it looked black, she also had pale skin sitting under a pedestrian dress for someone of the creator's stature, and a blindfold of all things pulled taut over her eyes. I am aware of what has befallen you and your kin, that is the reason I am here, Amaterasu Omakami. Chaos held a voice so calm that it sounded cold, despite not seeing emotions of any kind, the sun goddess felt like she had disappointed the creator of universes. Readjusting a squirming Naruto in her arm, Amaterasu turned her child and allowed his golden eyes to land on Chaos for the first time, you must be disappointed in how things turned out, Chaos, I certainly deserve your ire, as the leader of the Shinto pantheon, all failures fell on her shoulders. Chaos spent a second inspecting the curious baby Naruto before shaking her head, the true primordial then explained why she wasn't disappointed, when I create these universes, I do so free of expectation, I will not blame you for the path humanity has chosen for itself, there are things even gods can't control, Amaterasu Omakami. Having received a pardon from the ultimate authority, 
Amaterasu felt a weight lift from her shoulders, she breathed a large exhale without even realizing she had done so, however, I have come with an offer for you. With a surprising handful of words, Amaterasu found her reprieve dashed by curiosity, in its place, the kami wore a scrutinizing gaze one should expect from a divine leader, what are you proposing? Your son, I am offering to take him to another universe where I shall nurture him, he will learn of his origins and be taught how to harness his divine energies, you have my word, chaos glanced at Naruto playing with the folds of Amaterasu's elegant kimono, the sight put the smallest of smiles on the stoic woman's face. Do you want to take Naruto? Legitimately stunned, Amaterasu didn't know what to say, she had her plans, yes, but this was an unheard of opportunity, when Amaterasu looked at Naruto, it drew the godling's attention, in the moment their matching golden eyes met, she knew her answer, you'll protect him? Like he is one of my own, at this time, Chaos knew what Amaterasu's answer would be, however, she wasn't so cruel as to rush a mother through her goodbyes, she wasn't that cruel. The deep breath was to calm herself as Amaterasu held Naruto in front of her, one glimpse of his happy face and her tears flowed with renewed vigor, she must be looked like a mess, but Amaterasu didn't care, her whole world was Naruto, then, now, forever. I am afraid this is goodbye, for now, my sunshine, circumstances may keep us apart, but I will always be with you, and you with me, Naruto, never doubt that I loved you, my sweet child, there will be tough times, however, I'll always love and be proud of you, more than you could know, I, I, when Naruto reached for her tear-stained cheeks with a frown, Amaterasu didn't know if she laughed or cried harder. Oh, I wish we had more time, there is so much I want to share with you, but thank you, thank you for being my son, the sunshine that healed my broken heart, physically unable to say any more, she held Naruto under her chin, Amaterasu could have stayed like this for a hundred years, and it still wouldn't be enough, but the time had come. Even Chaos was moved by the tearful farewell, shedding a single tear herself as the goddess walked Naruto over, there was an understandable reluctance in Amaterasu as she placed Naruto gingerly in Chaos' arms, please take care of him. Both powerful women looked at Naruto, who Amaterasu put to sleep to make things easier on her, being a baby didn't stop Naruto from being acutely aware of when his mother was upset, her sunshine was perfect like that. Would you like to meet Naruto again in the future? Amaterasu's dimmed eyes shuffled from Naruto to her son's new adoptive mother, well, that's what she did after wiping her face on her kimono sleeve, I want that more than anything, but time won't be kind to me. There is a way around that, I can harness what's left of your divinity and store it in Naruto's soul, I can't tell you when, but it will allow you to meet your son again, when someone possessed reality warping power, they could afford to offer the spectacular, and only chaos could do it so casually. It was no surprise that the solar woman jumped at the opportunity, Amaterasu didn't know how such a thing was possible, but it was better than doing nothing, I'll do it. Thank you, thank you so much. Wait, I have something for Naruto. What started off as a golden shine between Amaterasu's hands changed into something else entirely when she pulled her hands apart, the object pulsated twice, and the luster faded to reveal a spear, but this wasn't just any spear, it was Amanonohoko. A myriad of emotions went through Amaterasu's smile as she stared at the spear once belonging to her father, it was an heirloom entrusted to her by Izanagi, and now she would give it to her son, this is Naruto's now. Chaos regarded the legendary weapon for a moment before the spear of Izanagi was sucked into a purple-black vortex, I will see Naruto receives it when he is ready, but now it's time, close your eyes, Amaterasu Omakami, when you open them again, you will see your son. Amaterasu took a deep breath and closed her eyes, with a nod of consent, the dark-haired goddess offered herself to the machinations of chaos, no sooner did a pillar of primordial power erupt from under Amaterasu's feet, trapping the Shinto Kami in the center, the force behind the black twister roared so forcefully it blew chaos hair back as she shielded Naruto with her powers. When the tunnel finally simmered down, there wasn't anything but a resplendent golden orb, floating toward chaos and her charge, the creator held the sphere in her hand and pressed it gently against Naruto's chest, it submerged into the baby's chest and left a sunmark over Naruto's heart. Watching the sun throb with gilded light, Chaos spoke, from this day forth, you are Naruto Omakami, the son of Amaterasu Omakami, you are the god of harmony, life, and heavenly light, you are the hope of your people and the sum of their legacy, you are the last Shinto Kami. Five years later where did you run off to this time, you little chaotic maelstrom? A voice steeped with wisdom and culture called out to their target, playful yet light, this was Nyx, the primordial goddess of night and elder sister of the aforementioned chaotic maelstrom. Her dark-themed dress flowed and shifted in rippling fashion as she moved down the hall, 
Nyx wasn't as lost as her words suggested, it was all part of the game, she saw and followed the tracks left by her target, a trail of burning footsteps. You can't hide from me forever, I am coming for you. Her dark painted lips quirked into a smirk set against pale skin, when the goddess saw the footprints and behind a long set of drapes, she knew she had found him. Throwing the curtains apart for dramatics and nothing else, Nyx let loose with her proclamation before she saw who was hiding behind it, I've got you now, you little mischief maker, and there he was, Naruto, the latest and last son of chaos, unlike NYX's other siblings, Naruto was a still growing child, that alone made him precious to Nyx. Their game of hide and seek was done and dusted, settled in favor of the older deity, seeing how Naruto lost, he responded like any child would, with a disappointed pout, a wh, no fair, how'd you find me so fast, big sis. Naruto's golden eyes stared at her, intent on learning how his elder sibling found him. Nyx guided Naruto with a simple pointing gesture, chuckling at her brother's endearing reaction, your footsteps give you away, Naruto, take a look, together the siblings watched as Naruto's footprints stretched down the hallway, some of the older imprints were fading, but the path was clear. Naruto moved his rich eyes back and forth between his feet and the treacherous trail, the gold in his gaze only amplified the annoyance he exuded, blast it. I thought I stopped doing that. Stupid freaking shiny footprints, initially, Naruto thought his fire imprints were sweet, now they were getting annoying. That means you have more training to do, isn't that right? As someone who knew more about Naruto's problem, Nyx was aware of the origins behind Naruto's blossoming gift, the son of a son, his raw power would be deadly and required training to fully control, however, they lucked out since Naruto actually enjoyed going out and training. The same could not be said for other gods and goddesses out there, Naruto was a strange boy like that. Naruto didn't complain about putting the work in, no matter how it took, he loved training with his gifts, and Naruto loved reading about Greek culture and history, honestly, the blonde child enjoyed everything about life with his family, you got it. It'll be the strongest, even stronger than you and mom. Wait hey. Put me down. I am too big to be carried like a baby. Okay, so maybe he didn't love everything. Naruto couldn't comprehend why Nyx kept treating him like a baby, he was already five years old. Definitely not a baby. Nyx allowed Naruto's frustrations to pass over her like a light drizzle, it was just a matter of sharing her news with Naruto. Once she did that, had give up his fight for self-dependence. Hush, you hellion, the longer you fight, the longer it takes to reach mother, we don't want to keep her waiting, do we? Just like how the sun rose in the east, Naruto's brilliant eyes widened in excitement at the mention of their shared mother. Chaos wasn't always around for obvious reasons, that made any time Naruto spent with her noteworthy, hence his reaction, you mean it? Mom's back? Yes. I haven't seen her in 500 years. His childish enthusiasm was curbed by a flick to the nose, unprepared for the move, Naruto yelped and rubbed carefully at the afflicted area, during this time, Nyx turned her physical chastising into vocal correction, do not exaggerate, Naruto, it is unbecoming of someone of your stature, chaos is waiting to see her son, but only if you let big sister carry you. Fine, Nyx was already walking with Naruto in her arms, but the godling consented nonetheless, it didn't happen often however, his big sister knew how to win an argument when she wanted. When they reached the room, Chaos was sitting behind a table, she looked out of place doing something so pedestrian, but this had become Chaos life since Naruto's adoption, Nyx greeted her creator and mother with a respectful smile, here he is, mother, as requested, your Chaos Razor. Mom. Naruto showed none of NYX's restraint as he bolted out of the goddess hold and right into his mother's welcoming embrace, he buried his smiling face against her shoulder and squeezed her tight. It's wonderful to see you, Naruto. Chaos took a moment to properly bask in her son's affections, once she did that, the first turned her concealed gaze onto Nyx, delivering an answer, and thank you for your help, Nyx. Spending time with Naruto is always a pleasure, with a parting nod, the night goddess took her leave, Nyx knew what Chaos had to say to Naruto and hoped things went well. The silence wasn't long lasting, leave it to an energetic, happy child like Naruto to fill the dead air, Big Sis said you were waiting for me, Mom. What are we going to do? Oh. Maybe we can go play in the void again. Please, Mom. Naruto really loved floating around the void, defying all rules of the universe with the aid of his mother's bottomless powers, if he could learn how to do it himself, Naruto would be all set, had probably even beat Nyx at hide and seek then. Naruto. Chaos soothing yet stern voice pulled Naruto out of the rabbit hole of his own creation. Naruto's beaming smile became a tight frown when he realized how serious his mom was, 
I have something important to share with you, I want you to sit and listen closely, do you understand? It's easy to forget because of his size and demeanor, but make no mistake, Naruto was a god, as such, his mind handled information much faster than a human child, that gave him a maturity beyond his years and a keen awareness of body language. What is it, mom? Chaos recited this conversation in her head at least a thousand times, through repetition, she decided it was best if she gave Naruto the information plainly, then it was up to Naruto to react as he deemed fit, Naruto, I am not your real mother, not the woman who gave birth to you. His confusion began with a gradual tightening in his brow, then Naruto's glittering eyes squinted into a pensive stare that tried hiding his turmoil, a handful of times and then some, Naruto attempted to speak but found himself with a distinct lack of words, what? There was one benefit to running this conversation beforehand, it allowed her to anticipate the many reactions Naruto might have, instead of sitting there in an awkward silence, chaos had the foresight to keep the conversation moving forward, I promised your mother and myself that I'd share the truth with you when the time was right, today is that day, if you were ready to hear me, my son. Explain, please? There were too many things Naruto wanted to ask chaos about, but for now, those were the only two words he could muster, his brain was too preoccupied trying to make sense of what he heard to do anything else. You haven't gotten this far in your studies, but there is a way for gods to die, it's called fading. This is when the belief in a god or goddess is abandoned. Unfortunately, your mother suffered this fate, and instead of sending you to the mortal realm as she planned, I convinced her that I should raise you in her stead. No, Nyx most certainly didn't get to the concept of gods dying in their studies, not even close, so what? I am the son of a titan or some Olympian in Greece. The slow delivery of his questions underlined the belief rattling shock circulating through the Shinto Godaling. No, you were mothered by a goddess from an entirely different pantheon, she shook her head and caused her pitch black locks to shiver against the bindings she used to keep it up. You mean, like the Egyptians or the Norse? Big Sis Nyx didn't talk about them much, no matter how much he tried to get the information out of Nyx, the goddess was never interested in talking about the other cultures more than necessary. Like them, but also different, this was it the moment of truth, with her honesty came the dreadful creep toward the thing chaos feared most, you are a Shinto Kami, Naruto. Having no clue who or what the Shinto were helped distract Naruto from the turmoil happening in his soul, however, ITD only last for so long, Shinto. But, I've never heard or read anything about a Shinto pantheon. Who are they? Where are they? The best way to explain to Naruto what happened to his people was to tell him about their history, it was a tale few people knew the truth about. The Shinto gods and goddesses originally hailed from the Far East, where I intended their domain to be, however, several factors changed those plans, some were minor, and others were major, but they all led to the same destination, while the rest of the world believes they faded millennia ago, the truth was they migrated. What do you mean migrated? It just didn't make sense. Gods and goddesses weren't a herd of animals. They don't get up and leave for no reason, such a thing happening was laughable due to the raw amount of power most major deities had at their disposal. Why? Why would they ever want to abandon their home? The entire story is far too long and complicated to cover now, the Shinto pantheon moved to a different universe with my blessing, from there, they ruled alone for some time until the world of man developed past the need for gods, without a foundation of belief to anchor them, the Shinto kami faded one after another until only a single goddess remained. Naruto connected the dots, and the realization that dawned on him was enlightening and painful, that goddess was my mom, wasn't it? No. This wasn't hurt, it was unbridled yearning, what an awful feeling. Yes, your mother, Amaterasu Omakami, was the chief deity of the Shinto realm, the goddess of the sun, ruler of Takamagahara, and your true mother, Naruto Omakami. Chaos manifested an image of the departed sun goddess for Naruto, selfishly, she did this to delay the moment she feared most. Chaos didn't fear any form of physical harm from Naruto, her worries circled around the emotional pain she'd suffer if Naruto chose to push her away. Their time together was short, but Naruto had become an irreplaceable part of her life. Amaterasu said it years earlier, Naruto was truly the embodiment of sunshine, he brought life into chaos existence and dragged out an aspect of the reclusive primordial that chaos hadn't experienced in her long lifetime. Now it makes sense, the fire footprints, the accidental toasting of the furniture, I Naruto could have gone on to say any number of things if not for the sudden urge to cry, he tried forcing it back, he tried telling himself this was no reason for tears, however, tears still built up over his golden irises. Don't hold it in, Naruto, say whatever you want to say, you deserve as much, the blonde youth surprised and brought relief in one gesture when he threw himself into chaos and cried silently into the crook of her neck. 
You truly are a kind child, Naruto. Part of chaos accepted she wasn't worthy of Naruto's love, but the selfish section of her soul was over the moon that Naruto didn't push her away. This is a good place to stop, there's no need to rush him through this. Ten years later now 16 years of age, Naruto stood on an artificial training field across from his mentor in tactics and combat training, had developed a toned musculature since maturing. Alongside that came a change in Naruto's hair, no longer was it pure blonde, the spiky tops of his golden locks turned black, like the sun bringing light to a dark sky, but otherwise, everything else was the same, including his golden days. Are you ready to begin, Meg? I should be asking you that, Naruto, this is possibly your final test, don't hold anything back, Meg, or Megara, was not only his trainer but a fury from the Greek underworld, she worked for both Hades and Nyx, it wasn't until Nyx had Meg swear on the sticks to secrecy that Naruto and Meg met, one. Naruto and the ashen-skinned Fury sister had become fast friends, Meg had no qualms pushing his limits in the early stages of their training, and Naruto never wanted to stop at the first goal, sure, there were a few instances where her sadistic tendencies bit him in the ass, but there was no denying the results. At least nothing she did left scars, Naruto came out of the partnership better than he entered, and that's all he could ask for. You don't have to tell me twice, his ready proclamation came with a shift in stance, Naruto opted for a style focusing on defensive maneuvers and counters, however, there was a look in his eye that Meg recognized right away, she knew he was up to something, the question was what? Start. Naruto opened the festivities right by blasting a cone of flames at Meg, the ground instantly charred under the intense heat of his golden flames, but this was the only damage Naruto inflicted as Meg swung right, avoiding the flame burst by half a foot. Meg rolled her piercing gaze onto Naruto as he lifted his left hand, his palm was still glowing hot from his last attack, that's when Naruto snapped his fingers, Hotaru, fireflies. The fury first disregarded the scraps of fire in the air as inconsequential, assuming they'd vanish with time, it ended up being a mistake on her part, because, instead of disappearing, the bits of flame formed into glowing spheres, the orbs reached critical mass and went off in a series of chain explosions around Meg. Using the smoke to her advantage, Meg turned the resulting plume into cover for her trademark whip, the cold steel lashed out from the cloud and went for Naruto, he tried blocking the chain but found her weaponized tendril wrapped around his arm, the blonde god grunted when Meg started dragging him toward her. She stepped from the smoke sporting singe marks on her clothing and heat bruises on her skin, however, it appeared she avoided anything debilitating, I have you now, what will you do, little godling? The question came hand in hand with a forceful tug on the whip, the pressure exerted on him tightened Naruto's jaw into a grimace. Naruto's response was less of an answer and more of a reaction, because without warning, his body burst into a dazzling pulse of light, unlike his flames which ranged from orange to gold, this was pure light, and it burned the unfortunate fury that took the explosion point blank, that was the stellar projection clone. The Shinto son wasted no time grabbing Meg by her bicep, he transitioned into an over-the-shoulder throw that slammed Meg into the ground at his feet, her lithe body bounced off the ground with a strained gasp, but even without her sight, she landed a jab kick on one of Naruto's shins. Both fighters were moving but in opposite directions, Meg was trying to rise back up while Naruto hit a knee, he tried to prevent her rise by placing a hand on her forehead, Meg just ended up knocking his hand away. The wings on Meg's back flapped a few times in preparation, she used the extra force generated to double kick Naruto in his chest, propelling him back with the soles of her feet, she sent the sun scion tumbling across their artificial training ground. Meg used the time Naruto spent ragdolling to stand up, there was still the occasional dot in her eyes, but she more or less stabilized after Naruto's quick start, but this wasn't just a fight, she also had a responsibility to teach the young Kami, you should nt have wasted time when I was blinded, you should have finished the fight. Naruto was chuckling to himself as he pushed himself off his chest, her kick might not be strong enough to leave a bruise, but it sure smarted, yeah, you're probably right, go on, do your worst, Meg. I intend to, since Naruto was keen to use so many of his godly powers in this fight, Meg thought it was about time she did the same, while not as potent as his powerful presence, Meg could definitely make Naruto feel the pain, her eyes were just starting to glow when her attempt ended prematurely, what did you do? Naruto didn't sport some nefarious grin or smug smirk, however, the mischievous twinkle in his affluent gaze gave him away, so was the bane of all flamboyant tricksters, sometimes, all you need is a single hand to change the flow of a fight, who needs stupid amounts of power when the simple route is so effective. Your sealing techniques. Even after all this time, Meg still had trouble wrapping her mind around the intricate art Naruto called Fuenjutsu. Yup, you got it, 
Naruto willed a symbol Meg couldn't make heads or tails of onto his palm, as if he needed to validate it when the proof was currently glowing on the Fury's forehead, Naruto never got tired of shutting someone down with a mere suppression seal, it was so simple it was beautiful. I can still fight, the fuming daughter of Nyx did just that as she shot toward Naruto with her wings beating behind her, there was a nearly silent boom as she drove toward the golden-eyed god. She only made it half the distance before the ground under her began to shift, that's when Meg saw another Naruto rise out of the soil, but it was too late to stop her momentum, which led her directly into a breath-wrenching knee. Aside from ripping the air from her lungs with his bone-clenching blow, Naruto also killed all of her momentum with a single strike, Meg fell to the ground in an undignified heap, this time, the fury wasn't allowed to stand, not with Naruto holding a fiery hand over her face, yield. Earth? Since when? Seemingly unconcerned by the imminent threat of immolation, Meg posed her question through a heaving breath, her ribs hurt, but she wouldn't let that stop her from getting answers. Although Naruto showed the beginnings of a smirk, he still refused to drop his guard for even a second, he might be in the dominant position, but the fight wasn't over yet, it's something I picked up after furthering my connection with the spear grandfather left behind, when Naruto thought about Amenenuhoko, there was a warmth in his heart, and it wasn't because of how strong the jeweled spear made him. Amenenuhoko was one of the only tangible connections to his family and ancestral home, not to mention the last gift his Kachan gave him, that alone made the emotional value of the spear infinitely more valuable to him than a simple power boost. I concede, Naruto nodded his head and turned the looming threat into a helping hand, once he hoisted her back to two feet, Meg kept their conversation moving forward, I still find it strange there is a god who fights with subtlety, finesse, and strategy over raw power. The response, a simple if not disingenuous wave of Naruto's hand, his face also showed a stark lack of interest in the idea as he explained his mentality toward the subject, meh, big showcases of power are for people with egos and something to prove, as far as I am concerned, I don't have to prove anything to anyone, but should it come to that, it'll turn my full power on someone, but not unless it's necessary. Meg stuffed a small breath of relief when she felt the seal on her flesh fade with the faintest of shivers, then you're well on your way, she wouldn't say it aloud because it wasn't her style, but she was immensely proud of Naruto, he transitioned from an energetic boy to a noble, reasonable man, he was every bit the Shinto prince he was born to be. She couldn't say the same for most of the gods she knew. Thanks to you and a lot of other people, Meg, thank you. Naruto respected Magera too much to understate her role in his development, his humble diversion did the impossible, it made the tough woman smile, it was a small one, but a smile nonetheless. The barrier containing their latest spar came down, allowing the regal presence of chaos onto the simulated field, she had nothing but good things to say, well done, you too, Magera. I believe Nyx requires your services in the underworld, you're dismissed. Any pretense of being relaxed vanished under a stiff wave of professionalism as most did when crossing paths with chaos, not only did Meg's back straighten, she also offered a silent nod before she was sent back to the underworld by chaos. So? What did you think, mom? Just knowing chaos watched his latest spar put a beaming smile on the young deity's face, it didn't happen often, so Naruto cherished it when it did happen. I am a proud mother, and I know Amaterasu would be too. The warmth pumping through his heart increased exponentially at her praise, her approval meant the world to Naruto who only wanted to make her proud, oh yeah, he already felt the grin spreading across his tanned face. Naruto's hand was already up in his hair, scratching the back of his scalp as he tried to respectfully rebuke the praise chaos gave him, thanks, it means a lot, I still have a way to go before I reach Ka Chan's level, but I won't stop until I surpass her flames, that's a promise. Huh. Mom. What's wrong? His serene expression and the easygoing smile settled on his face turned into bewilderment, she definitely surprised Naruto when Chaos caught him in a warm embrace, she usually wasn't one for blatant showings like this. Today is the day you leave and see the world through your own eyes, I wish to hug my son one more time before that happens, Chaos would have never pictured herself doing something like this, however, that just goes to show how unpredictable life can be, not even Chaos was immune to its twists and turns. Golden eyes softened and took an understanding look before the blonde closed his eyes and melted into the loving embrace of his adoptive mother. I'm more thankful than you'll know for your guidance, no matter how far I go or how long it's been, I will always be your son. There was only one thing left for Naruto to say, I love you, mom. Naruto pushed down on his pestle, applying pressure to mush up the various herbal agents, after a few minutes of work, Naruto finished perfecting his tonic, setting the mashing tool on the table, he held a glowing hand over the bowl, 
he closed his eyes in concentration, it took some effort to move the glow from his hand to the remedy, when he finished, the paste emitted a shine only Naruto saw. Happy with the end result, the blonde walked into the adjacent room, in the process, Naruto joined a young mother, who held a damp cloth against her slumbering son's forehead, the boy had been weighed down with a bad case of pneumonia for a few days now. Initially, she thought the sickness would pass, when it got worse, not better, it was up to her to gather the courage and move her sickly son, when she arrived at Naruto's door, the fretful mother offered everything she had if Naruto could cure her son, he told her there would be no payment until the boy recovered, but he never really planned on taking anything from Mira. Only one thing could have drawn her attention from her bedridden boy, and that was the person who promised to heal her only child, her face wore stress lines ripe with worry as she looked at the bowl sitting in Naruto's hands, is that it? It will make my hackleys better, right? Naruto pulled a chair to the free side of the bed, this way, he could speak and work at the same time, he used one hand to keep his patient's mouth open while his fingers scooped up a healthy gathering of paste, yes, it will, he'll put this under his tongue, and the saliva will break the paste down, then, he'll swallow it naturally, you should start seeing signs of improvement within two hours, three at most. Sadly, Naruto couldn't cure the boy just like that, it wasn't feasibly possible, the amount of divine energy required would fry the child's body from the inside out, it didn't matter how he modified them, Naruto's powers weren't naturally restorative, thus the limits on his healing skills. Oh, thank you so much, my lord. You must be blessed by Naruto almost didn't reach the thankful woman in time because he was busy wiping his hands clean, however, he made it in the nick of time to stop her from saying a name she should nt. Naruto didn't need an extra hurdle in his path, there was truth in the idea of names carrying power. He appeased her desire to credit him with modest deflection, it was a practice unheard of in gods, who relish praise from mortals like they did Ambrosia, the only thing I have been blessed with is the chance to help people in need. One smile later and Naruto released her hands, then came a gesture to the room around them, you're welcome to stay here until little Hakels can travel home. The tears rolled down her cheeks without an end in sight, however, this time they were a sign of abundant joy, not overwhelming worry, she didn't know why Naruto didn't want his credit, but if that's what he asked, then shed oblige, may I ask for your help once more, my lord? What is it? Do you have an ailment as well? While she didn't bring it up, she might be suffering from something also, it was a frequent problem among the people across Greece. The youthful matron shook her head emphatically, rejecting the idea, no. What I ask isn't for myself but for another, people in my village speak of a pregnant woman in the woods, they don't know what troubles her, but there is trouble, sure, it came across as far-fetched, but what if it wasn't? Naruto hadn't heard those rumors personally but had also been busy with his healing practices, he didn't have the time to sit around and listen to idle gossip. As a mother, I can't imagine a more unbearable fate than being unable to see your child safely into this world, perhaps you can help her as you have helped me. If it's not too much trouble, my lord, after seeing Naruto's skills firsthand, she bought into the hype around the sunny healer, it was as incredible as it was unbelievable. True or false, Naruto knew himself well enough to know he was physically incapable of letting the rumor go, he needed to investigate it, that's just how he was built, so he answered with a nod, I'll go right now and search this woman out, you were the last of my arrivals for the day, so please make yourself at home while I am gone. Naruto smiled when he watched the woman's shoulders sag with relief, whatever burdens she put on her shoulders were finally no more, leaving Mira looking like she needed a much deserved nap. Excusing himself, Naruto stepped out of the building and let a trickle of his divine energy out into the open, he used it as a radar. It told the blonde of someone godlike nearby, huh, I should have noticed that a long time ago, let's go see what's up. He vanished with a golden flash of light, transporting himself to the heart of the nearby forest, the smell of the sea on the coast welcomed Naruto, he noticed how alive the land under his feet was, and it wasn't his doing, this time, this piqued the juvenile godling's interest. Naruto scoped out the trees surrounding him upon feeling eyes on him, he couldn't find any offenders, but Naruto knew someone was there. Opting for the diplomatic route, Naruto called out, You don't have to hide from me, I have no desire or reason to harm you, I actually want to help you if I can. The woman who stepped out was a handful of inches taller than Naruto, her blonde hair and fair complexion glimmered in the late evening sun, leaving the Shinto legacy stunned by her beauty. Naruto never saw his mother or sister in this way, which meant this woman was the most beautiful woman had seen in his young life, and it wasn't even close. What brings a young man so far off the traveled path? Leto was accustomed to men looking at her with intent, eventually, she grew numb to the looks of lust she'd receive, however, this young mon's stare was different. 
It was innocent. It was appreciative maybe even odd if Leto was reading him right. The unspoken compliment left her with a smile. She was pleased to know she could still turn heads this deep in her pregnancy. I heard there was a woman in need of some help. A pregnant woman. Naruto paused and looked at Leto's protruding stomach. As something of a healer, I thought I might offer a helping hand. My name is Leto. I am sure your talents are considerable and thank you for offering them to me. However, I am afraid there is little to be done. Even for a god such as yourself, Leto saw no reason to dance around the subject. She knew what Naruto was and wasn't hesitant about sharing the knowledge with her fellow blonde. Leave the games and schemes for Olympus. She had no need of them here. A ghost of a smile played itself on Naruto's lips. Well then, it was only fair he responded with the same respect Leto showed him. If things are already dire, then another perspective couldn't hurt, could it, Titanus? Her lips pursed in pensive thought before the motherhood entity relented to Naruto's valid point. Who knows, maybe he could help her. No, I suppose it wouldn't. Then, if I may. Naruto waited until Leto consented to put one hand against her pregnant stomach. He tapped into some of his godly domain and immediately detected something that left him with a frown. What he discerned caused the hairs on his forearms to rise in apprehension. Someone placed a curse on you. Your power is fighting off the worst of it, but I can sense it clinging to you. What cruel mind spawned this? Their contact became a two-way street, allowing the expecting Titanus mother to detect something about Naruto. Her curiosity got the better of both her and her tongue. Your signature is different from any god I've met. Would you tell me why that is? Naruto rolled the idea over in his head. Leto seemed like a trustable sort. She had this aura around her that was agreeable to his senses. Plus, sharing something about himself might build the requisite trust necessary to make Leto talk. Screw it. What's life without some risk? I am Naruto Omakami. What you're sensing right now is something traced outside of this pantheon. Me and my lineage belong to another group. I am a Shinto Kami. Naruto resolutely avoided using the words last Shinto Kami since it was a wound he still hadn't made peace with. Naruto stepped backward when Leto gasped out of the blue. Her eyes were drawn wide in a look of total surprise, and a hint of familiarity if such a thing was possible. A Shinto Kami. My father told me stories about them in my younger days, but I thought they all disappeared. As the titan of foresight, her father had an incredible depth of knowledge on just about everything. Miracles can happen, even for gods, Leto couldn't help but think Naruto's smile wasn't entirely genuine, can you tell me about this curse? Like the specifics? Leto hesitated for a second, if it wasn't only her fate at stake. Shed politely declined Naruto's request, but it wasn't just her, there were two others she needed to think about, I lapsed in judgment, which ended in an affair with the king sitting on Olympus, while I regret my part in that, I will always cherish the gifts of our connection, my children, it doesn't matter what anyone says, the queen herself included, but her anger at me wasn't enough, her wraith extended to the product of our affair, my unborn children. Naruto filled in the blanks left by the names Leto wouldn't say. He mentally thanked Nyx for her hard work teaching him everything Greek, without her help, had be so lost, Naruto was dragged out of his thoughts when Leto spoke her curse aloud. No land with roots in the earth will receive you, Leto, your children will have no roots, no home, this is your punishment. But I can only give birth when I am on the ground, hence the source of my woes, Leto admitted with a notable frown on her beautiful face, she still wondered who told Hera about her most private secret. That is spite in its most thorough form, but there must be a weakness, like, Naruto trailed off as his mind started putting together the pieces of something unorthodox, his devious creativity must have shown if Leto saw enough to coax him onward. What are you thinking, Naruto? What Naruto was about to say was crazy. He only hoped Leto didn't think he was crazy for suggesting it, taking a breath, he let his idea out, an island, but not in the sea, what about an island in the sky? His glinting, golden eyes stared back at the much older woman, waiting for feedback. Leto didn't make it to where she was without intelligence, despite lacking details the broad picture was painted and implanted in her brain, untethered, a surge of hope flooded Leto's eyes as she cradled her stomach tenderly, then I'd be able to give birth to my twins, though does a place like this exist? The blonde-haired son Spawn shook his head, no, or at least, not yet. Naruto thought back on the stories Chaos told him about Amanonahoko. He recalled how his grandfather and grandmother used the jeweled spear to create the first islands, it wasn't going to be easy, but Naruto was willing to try for Leto's sake. And you plan on making one? Leto wanted to believe, yet this task seemed impossible, this felt like an undertaking only Mother Earth herself could achieve. Yes, but not without some preparation in this. Naruto willed his inherited weapon to his side, the legendary Amanonahoko, 
It was different from last time, in correspondence with Naruto's growth, the jewels inlaid in the spear's shaft pulsated the same color as the sunset, the sudden power flowing through the blonde pulled an exhilarated exhale out. Leto also felt the presence radiating off the weapon firmly in Naruto's grasp, that spear, it gave off a feeling similar to Kronos and his scythe, she only saw it a few times, but she wouldn't forget the time titan's diabolical disposition, and she couldn't believe it, but the spear felt more formidable than the favored scythe of Zeus' father. Would you please follow me, Leto? The sea should end be far, with that said, Naruto turned the other way and led the titan into the forest, his spear became something of a walking stick during their journey to the sea. That same walking stick became the focal point of Leto's focus, she was so enraptured by its looming potential that she couldn't remove her eyes from it, mixed in with her respect was a healthy amount of fear, that's quite the fearsome weapon in your hand, titan or not, Leto had no plans on being on the receiving end of Amanonahoko anytime soon. Oh? This? For a split second, Naruto was tempted to twirl the spear, however, he thought better of it, it's a tool like any other, sure, it can cause destruction, however, it's capable of creation, which I hope to show you shortly, he held both qualities of Amanonahoko in different regards but personally valued the latter more. The sun doesn't destroy. The sun gives life, it creates for all people. I hope he'll see it as well. The murmured comment passed without a response from Naruto as he kept focused on the path in front of them. After a brief walk through the forest, Naruto and Leto stood at the precipice of a steep cliff. This spot should do nicely. Moving the kanji from his brain to the real world wasn't hard, but the process took time. The air became a canvas for the creation of his latest seal. When the last pieces fell into place, it was time to trigger the Fuinjutsu by calling out its name, Shinsei no Q, Sphere of Sanctity. What was that? Leto didn't see what Naruto did, but the shiver moving across her skin made sure Leto felt it, however, wherever she looked, Leto found nothing out of the ordinary. What Leto failed to find, Naruto saw clearly, he watched the ethereal film of his sphere spread out in every direction, it continued without issue until it reached the limit set by the kanji, then the nearly invisible wall fizzled out as the fade worked its magic, that was me temporarily cutting ties with the sky and sea, I don't want Thunderhead or the seaweed swimmer sticking their nose in what comes next, oh, and please, keep this to yourself. I swear on the the word sticks never made it past Leto's lips thanks to Naruto's knowing interruption. Naruto turned his head just far enough to leave one golden eye visible over his left shoulder, your word is enough, Leto, I don't require or want that dreadful oath hanging around either of us, how messed up of a world did they live in where a threat of eternal death was needed to ensure someone kept their word. They had only known each other for around an hour, and Leto already had a good idea about the character of Naruto, without realizing it herself, Leto found herself comfortable with the idea of her children becoming gods like the one standing in front of her, but even if they didn't, she'd love them dearly because that's what a mother does. The amused laughter Leto put behind her hand served as background noise for the start of Naruto's project, he began by folding both of his hands around the spear in prayer. There was a soft hum in the air before an explosion of untamed power came off Naruto, blowing Leto's long hair backward, even pieces of the ground splintered from the pressure he exerted on the area. Absolutely incredible, what else was there to say when watching small rocks go against gravity, only to end up vaporized by the energy field surrounding the young god, then without warning, Naruto braced the spear against his inner forearm and jumped into the waters below with a distant splash. Sprinting to the cliff's edge, the titanus stared down at a whirlpool forming in the previously calm water, against the sound of the rough tide, Leto managed to pick up the noise of fracturing land, when the peak of a submerged ridge broke the sea's foamy surface, Leto felt her mouth drop in silent awe, I was right, Naruto is already more powerful than most of the gods I know, and I would have never expected it from looking at him. The entire ordeal of elevating the land chunk from the sea took the better part of two hours, he returned to land eventually, but he did so drenched in seawater, Standing at the threshold of two previously unconnected land masses, Naruto took a breath and lifted his famed spear overhead. Streams of salt-stained water were still running down Naruto's face as he drove the entire length of his spear's blade into the ground with an audible grunt, a moment later, the land sported a complex system of glowing, white veins that resonated with how much power Naruto was channeling into the ground at his feet. Not even a full second later, the ground jerked violently, Leto looked up and found the sky getting closer. Naruto had done what he promised, he created a land without roots, an island in the sky. When their island transportation finally ceased its ascent, the blonde mother felt like she could reach out and touch the clouds, that's when it hit her, 
realizing what this meant for her and her family nearly brought Leto to tears. Leto looked to congratulate Naruto on his incredible feat but found the young man on a knee and breathing hard, reaching his side, she helped him back to his feet, getting a tired smile from the younger blonde. Phew, I told you, it was a piece of scratch that, it was a pain to make that stubborn soil move, without the mental focus needed to keep Amenenuhoko at his side, Naruto relied on Leto to help keep him balanced. Leto found herself with plenty of reasons to smile, whether it was because of Naruto's lighthearted attitude or the chance to finally have her children, this was a debt she could never repay, I am forever in your debt, thank you from the bottom of my heart. An unflattering snort made itself known right quick, Naruto used his free hand like a baton, swatting away the idea of a debt, that really wasn't his style, forever is too long for us immortals, how about you do something for me, and I call a square. Leto's smile remained in place as she looked at Naruto from the corners of her eyes, from what she'd seen, she should nt have expected any less, and what is that? I need you to name this place, Naruto chimed in with a grin wide enough to show his white teeth in their entirety. Name it, Naruto's odd request left Leto blinking in confusion, why did the land need a name? Did it not already have a name? Yeah, a name, this isn't Mykonos anymore, Mykonos is down there, your island, your home needs a name, Naruto would have been more emphatic about the whole thing if he wasn't so tired, but for now, head make Dubai pointing south, hundreds of feet down, Mykonos and this island were officially two different entities. Delos, we shall call it Delos, a newfound sense of inner peace filled Leto's soul as she put the name of her home out in the universe. I'd call it ironic, but you did see the island come out of the waves, truth be told, Naruto would have approved of any name Leto selected because it was her home, the adopted son of chaos let a peaceful moment pass before adding something uneasily, so you don't need any help with the birth thing, right? Because I don't have the foggiest idea how to make that work. Leto felt the anxiety coming through their skin contact, she thought the nervousness he showed to be adorable, hence the uncontrollable giggling, no, I don't need any additional help, don't worry, I already have plans in place for this moment. Naruto slumped in relief, nearly tumbling over in the process, the aftereffects of his draining task became apparent to him as his eyes drooped with fatigue, he respected what his grandfather and mother did even more than before after this, too. That's fantastic news, I am gonna go take a three-day nap, at least, oh, and before I forget, I carved something into the bottom of the island, it will render Delos invisible to anyone who doesn't have your permission to see it, Naruto liked to think of it as his housewarming gift to Leto. Mere words can't express how truly thankful I am for everything you have done, Naruto, just like it was in Naruto's nature to avoid praise, Leto felt obligated to give Naruto the thanks he was owed. Nonsense, I am nothing but a nosy kid, good luck, Leto, and to a degree, what he said about himself was the truth, he only crossed paths with Leto because he couldn't let the words of another mother go. This is your home as much as it is mine, don't be a stranger. Naruto, the blasé attitude surrounding Naruto finally cracked, from its husk came a peaceful smile, bright and radiating warmth, it was like whatever baggage on Naruto's shoulders went away for a moment. Personally, Leto found the sight to be beautiful, she preferred it over the wry grins and measured smirks that often covered the blonde's face, like a mask. I'll keep that in mind, goodbye for now, Leto. Zeus Temple, Olympus. King of Olympus, Lord of the Sky. Zeus looked up from the plate of food he was indulging in, Zeus put his midday meal aside for the moment before acknowledging his fellow god with a stoic nod, there you are, Boreas, we have some business to discuss post haste. Boreas showed deference to the king by bowing to him, which hid most of his courteous smile, the honor of being in Zeus' temple was something many gods would die for, Boreas wanted to make the most of it, when you call, I'll always do my best to answer. Lord Zeus, anyone with a shred of common sense understood winning Zeus' favor meant playing on his super-sized ego. The satisfaction sketched across the Thunderer's face showed how effective it was as a tactic, he seemed over the moon as he stroked his august beard, good, good, Olympus could use more loyalty like yours, Olympus was a den of schemes, though most of them were afflicted on the mortals living in the shadow of their mountain. What is your task, my lord? Name it, and I'll do my utmost to achieve it, normally. Boreas wouldn't commit himself to something without knowing what it entailed, but negotiating with Zeus required a different approach, so it was when dealing with someone that held all the power. A week back, there was a strange sensation, a disruption, I was preoccupied at the time speaking with Hera, Boreas wisely kept his mouth shut, when Zeus said speaking, he meant arguing with his wife over another affair, 
Boreas wondered if it was a mortal or a mortal this time. To check on it, I want you to act on my behalf, go forth and see if you can sniff out the cause, as you're aware, a challenge on my domain is equivalent to treason. May I ask where this crime took place? Other than a nod, Boreas refused to add anything to the discussion, he wanted to get to work as soon as possible, hopefully, his hunt was going to be short and fruitful. After a day of calculation, I believe the source to be Mykonos, though ITD be wise if you included all the islands surrounding Mykonos in your search, Zeus may have worded it like a suggestion, but make no mistake, this was very much an order from the king to his subject. The only correct response was complete obedience. Then I shall leave right away. Offering one more bow to the respectable king, Boreas got to his feet and turned to leave, he was one step away from the temple's archway when Zeus' thunderous voice stopped him. And remember, the punishment for this injustice is death, Boreas, don't fail me, with the severity in Zeus' voice, one would think he was accusing Boreas himself of the crime. Never, my lord, the response was delivered after a moment of thought, then the wide-bodied god excused himself from Zeus' home on Olympus, once he was off the temple steps, Boreas' kind smile became a look of contempt, a twisted look of envy, sibling of jealousy. The thunder-brained blowhard is truly insufferable, he thinks with his cock more than his brain, but he has the power to make my ambition a reality, so if I must, ill lick his boots, no matter how sour the taste, to achieve the station he rightfully desired, Boreas of the North Wind would suffer the indignity of being commanded like a peasant by Olympus number one man whore. But that did bring up something Boreas should at least consider, perhaps I should look into taking a more permanent woman to my bed, the mortals of Greece often wither with time, and a mortal woman would be best, I could make that Orithia woman from Athens mine, that one caught his eye, she was by far the most enticing of the mortal women on offer. Business first, then I can focus on pleasure. Mykonos, Greece. Naruto lingered around Delos for a few days, just putting some finishing touches on the island, he only stopped when he felt the amount of divine presence on the island triple, Leto must have given birth to two fully grown beings, and that told Naruto it was time for him to leave Delos for the time being. He returned to Mykonos, and all was good for another handful of days until an odd chill in the wind descended on the island, the people around Naruto shrugged off the unnaturally cold mornings, but the blonde Shinto knew better, someone had come to Mykonos. Confident that this had something to do with him, Naruto spent less and less time in the village center, whenever things came to a head, he didn't want the collateral damage on his conscience, that meant moving into the uninhabited forests around Mykonos and waiting. Naruto stroked the back of his feathered friend's neck with a finger, the hooting chirp of content he got for his efforts left Naruto chuckling, it's time you fly away, my friend, things are about to get dangerous around here. The brown feathered owl looked in the same direction as Naruto, the large avian ruffled its feathers before taking off, left alone to face the forthcoming trial, Naruto felt oddly comfortable with the situation. Naruto put on a welcoming smile as Boreas pushed through the nearby tree line, unlike the blonde on the log, the older deity was quite annoyed with his surroundings, he was tired of pulling twigs from his hair. Hello, sir, welcome to Mykonos, if you're looking for civilization, you're a hundred miles in the wrong direction. Boreas did not share the same humor Naruto displayed, in fact, the playful nature of Naruto's voice rankled the wind deity's already worn nerves, do not play games with me, boy, are you Naruto, the healer in these parts? He refrained from rolling his eyes at the old man in the butchering of his name, I've been called that, yes, Naruto admitted with a drawl, folding his hands together against his lap. Tell me, which god sired you, and where are they now? The bark demand came with a matching scowl, seeing a lack of perceived respect from Naruto plummeted what was left of Boreas' good mood, he refused to be disrespected by some half-blood child. Aren't you full of questions? The twinkle tucked away in Naruto's gilded pools showed amusement, he knew precisely what buttons he was pushing, it wasn't Naruto's fault that most gods took themselves too seriously, where was the fun in life with a stick up your ass? Boring. Answer the question, child. For someone who represented winter, Naruto thought Boreas had an ironically short fuse on his red-hot anger. Maybe he should offer the white-haired man a nap. Oh, right, he made a demand, ITD be improper to ignore him. No, 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 watching the man come undone at the seams was more entertaining than it had any right being. Naruto couldn't help but prod him with the metaphorical stick and see what happened, after dealing with modest people daily for months, this god felt like a caricature of an actual person. Yup. I grow tired of these games. Zeus wanted anyone suspicious dead, but you'll be brought to him in chains, 
then you can tell our esteemed king which of his relatives is the traitor. A hoarfrost whipped up around Boreas as gusts of unseasonably cold air answered the fuming snowman's call. It wasn't the show of power that caught Naruto's attention, it was the threat. Can you? Bring me back in chains? There was a subtle shift in Naruto's tone, an understated element of intense danger usually hidden by Naruto's noble spirit. However, the careless callousness being shown by Boreas brought out the darker side of Amaterasu's air. Why don't you come and find out, boy? Extending his arms toward Naruto, the north wind called upon his domain to produce an icy wind, it flowed toward Naruto, but the young blonde was ready for it encountered with his own godly gifts. Naruto lit the atmosphere ablaze with the cruel heat of his fire, the creeping chill of winter's grasp stood no chance against the sun's fury, as soon as Naruto's burning wraith hit the wind, the flames and heat spread, in a flash, they swallowed the Greek god in a pillar of fire, the pain Boreas' voice was immense, meanwhile, Naruto slowly took to his feet. He allowed the man to burn for an entire minute in the flames of his judgment, when the blonde finally called his fire off, Boreas' body was covered in scorching wounds, the damage inflicted on him made Boreas shake catatonically before he collapsed to his knees, it seems like the minion of Zeus was barely conscious. Naruto's measured gait was as methodical as a predator stalking its prey. It didn't matter how injured Boreas appeared, Naruto wasn't in any rush to put him down, let the fool feel the pain of overstepping, people like you, who speak so candidly about robbing another of their freedom, should never hold power, perhaps that is why you're still a minor god, Boreas of the North Wind, your weak, spirit and body, the heat coming off Naruto's body started undoing the frost damage caused by the winter spirit's brief outburst. Palming the older being's forehead tightly enough to make Boreas cry out in pain, Naruto followed it up by crushing the servant of Zeus into the ground, Boreas slammed into the dried ground three times before his eyes rolled back into his head, and the world went black. Normally, I'd abhor doing this, but I have no desire to be drawn into the Thunder King's game of paranoia at this time. Dropping the limp body into the human-shaped indent in the ground, Naruto gazed at the seal he imprinted on Boreas' forehead. This particular piece was a memory seal that would trick Boreas into believing he found nothing during his hunt, nothing, that is what had report to Zeus. My mother's name would provide me protection, however, I won't use chaos as a shield, until I can protect myself from people like the so-called Big Three. I will remain in the shadows, he loved his mother dearly, however, Naruto didn't want to use her name. He wanted to make a name for himself, a path of his own, if that meant training his body for months at a time until he collapsed from exhaustion, then that's what Naruto would do, he wanted to make this world a better place, and no amount of work would stop Naruto Omakami from doing just that. When the mortals thought about their gods, they conjured images of a mountain in the clouds gilded with splendor and riches beyond their wildest imagination, so, if those same mortals knew where Naruto and Nyx were meeting, their heads might have exploded from shock, metaphorically speaking. When Nyx arrived on the mostly empty farm fields, she was in a much younger form than Naruto was used to seeing, however, the shift in appearance didn't stop Naruto from smiling when he noticed her presence, the only one not happy with her arrival was the deer basking with Naruto, his lack of attention to the animal resulted in an end to its scalp rub. The approach of the primordial goddess caused the deer to run off, Naruto rose to his feet, and the siblings shared a meaningful hug, Nyx didn't bother moving her face from his shoulder. She resorted to speaking through him so that she might enjoy her younger brother's embrace for as long as possible. This is your most imaginative spot thus far, Naruto. Even if her point was made under the teasing guise of sisterly affection, Naruto felt the need to defend himself and his questionable locale. What kind of god or goddess would willingly spend time on a farm? Don't say it like that. Who would think to look for a pair of gods on cattle grazing land? Sometimes right under the nose is the best hiding spot. It appears you've already started learning from the mortals, mother will be pleased, it wasn't just chaos, Nyx was also happy to see Naruto was thinking with his brain, too many current gods and goddesses fell back on their overwhelming power or divine influence to resolve their problems, this didn't directly affect the night matron, but even she saw how it negatively impacted the human population. Something the pale-skinned woman said caused the bright smile on Naruto's face to partially dim, a stranger wouldn't be able to tell the two looks apart, but a woman who raised Naruto. She absolutely noticed the subtle change on her dear brother's face, what happened? Internally, Naruto cursed himself for letting his emotions slip, nothing, dear sister, how about you tell me what you wanted to talk about? His attempt at moving them back to their original purpose wasn't as subtle as Naruto wanted, that's one of many reasons why the blonde god wasn't surprised to see Gambit fail miserably. The stern glare she dropped on Naruto was capable of melting Olympus itself, Naruto was sure of it, 
not to mention how it made him feel like a small godling again. Yes, we will talk about what's bothering you, and don't try and lie to me again. Naruto, I will only allow you this one chance to come clean. Naruto had no desire to be punished by his older sister, while he might not be the most prideful man walking the earth. The idea of being spanked by Nyx was mortifying. Fine, you win, however, I don't want you rushing off until you hear everything I say, promise me that much, sis. Flashback start. The amount of hope in the air was almost tangible as the people celebrated this year's harvest festival, drink and grain flowed in spades, leaving the young and old alike in a fervor of passionate life affirmation, small villages such as these didn't have a reason to celebrate often, but when they did, they were some of the best parties around. None of the mortals suspected the godly addition to this year's festivities, Naruto Omikami just finished his dance with the young daughter of a local farmer, she was a cute little thing who couldn't be much older than five, both Naruto and the girl's parents found her obvious crush amusing. The playful spirit trapped inside the Shinto son could not help but finish the dance with a teasing flourish, which amounted to him bowing to his miniature partner and kissing the back of her hand with a smile, Naruto's knowing expression grew as the blush on her face burned hot, thank you for the dance. Naruto made sure he left the parental pairing with a wave, their continual laughter helped keep his smile going, soon he found his way to the long table where the whole village was gathered to partake in the festival's annual feast, Naruto didn't know any of these men or women personally, but that did not stop him from admiring their unity, looking at them now, he could see one big family. Sometimes it isn't blood that makes a family, but rather time and understanding. Excuse me, I hope this seat wasn't saved for someone, Naruto's thoughts on human behavior were delayed a little longer, turning right, he was genuinely caught off guard by the attractive woman now next to him, her golden hair was impressively long and drew the fading sun's light, and the brown-eyed woman also had a chest that many men would desire. But what stood out most about the woman was the divinity Naruto felt floating around her, it was almost like she wasn't there despite sitting next to him, no one in Naruto meant no one, even glanced at her breathtaking presence, that told Naruto something wasn't quite right about this lady's sudden arrival. Naruto flashed his most courteous smile, shaking off his half-put-together theories, it was a look that really showed how handsome Naruto could be, maybe not princely, but definitely exotic, not at all, this festival is meant for everyone to enjoy. A surge of satisfaction hit the younger blonde when he saw a blush tinting the goddess flawless face, if he needed to put effort into charming someone, then you can bet he wanted it to work, yes, it warms the heart to see everyone coming together to indulge in the boon of a well-cultivated harvest. He nodded along with every word, showing a loose agreement with the sentiment of his companion's thoughts, once they hit a lull, Naruto remembered something rather important, ah, where are my manners? My name is Naruto. Your name sure is strange, you can call me Demeter if it pleases you, Demeter, goddess of agriculture, traded one name for the other, but not until she was done laughing behind her hand, clearly, Naruto's antics entertained her enough to bring out her gentle laugh. Covering his silence with a welcoming smile, Naruto felt a single word take hold of his mind, Olympian, but Demeter was more than that, here he was talking with a child of Kronos, that fact alone was enough to keep Naruto even keel. I saw you dancing with the little one over there, I hope you don't mind if I steal you for a dance after the meal, as someone favoring good looks and manners, Demeter found Naruto to be quite the attractive young man, and hence, she had no reservations about pursuing him more personally. Honestly, Naruto didn't want to dance, the problem was he didn't have an acceptable reason to say no, any excuse he could come up with would be suspect at best, so, loath as he was to admit it, Naruto only had one reasonable choice, I'd be foolish to deny a beautiful woman at least one dance. Ah, uh, he hated how courtship tasted on his tongue, the old way of doing things felt so forced, it didn't help that Naruto didn't see Demeter in that light, yet, if this is what was required of him, then Naruto would bear it for now. Flashback pause back in present times, Nyx already wasn't a fan of what she was being told, the circumstances leading to Naruto's chance meeting with a wheat-loving woman were concerning and infuriating, who does that grain-brained harvest whore think she is? It'll show her what it means to toy with my little brother. The ruthless intentions rolling off the primordial's childish appearance were more than tangible, NYX's protective rage was already forcing a handful of grazing cows to yowl in panicked bursts, Naruto raised a silent brow as the fretful sounds got further and further away no doubt due to the cows doing their best to flee from NYX's dubious presence. Unaware of the loathsome aura she was still releasing, Nyx voiced her opinion in a deceptively calm tone, it's no coincidence that an Olympian showed up in the middle of nowhere, harvest festivals are common throughout all of Greece, that was no exaggeration, 
there had to be hundreds of these parties in southern Greece alone. Looking back on his meeting with Demeter, Naruto could see that all too clearly, but things weren't as easy as telling the goddess no, doing something thoughtless like that would have consequences for him and the people around him, yeah, but I couldn't turn her down so blatantly, she might not be known as a fighter, but any Olympian is plenty capable of wiping out a settlement with a snap of their fingers. You always did have a soft spot for the mortals, as one of the few who had the privilege of seeing Naruto grow up, Nix understood her younger brother's views on humanity, instead of critiquing him for it, Nix accepted his feelings. It should nt be the exception, it should be the rule, but I won't waste my breath, you already know how I feel about the exploitation mortals face, Naruto took a needed breath, he knew Nix wasn't against him on this, but the current role of mortals never failed to fan his flames, at this point, it was a matter of keeping his ire aimed at the correct places, blindly lashing out wouldn't do him or the mortals any favors. Naruto. Tell more about your meeting with the harvest goddess, what did she want from you? Her sharp retort suggested Nix was done with the small talk, she wanted the information that Naruto rather keep to himself. That's the thing, we shared a dance and bantered a little bit, nothing really happened, it wasn't worth mentioning at the time, even for someone on edge like I was back then, Naruto looked up to the clouds as he thought back to that day, and the long list of days that followed it. All was quiet on that front until I crossed paths with her a month later, no, it was probably closer to 40 days, either way, here's what happened. Flashback continues, Naruto wondered what his Ka-chan would think if she saw him now, the powerful Naruto Omikami wasn't burning some monster to smoldering ash, or going out on a great adventure, no, he was knee-deep in the dirt, tending to a vegetable garden he created to help the village with its winter food problem. You have an excellent garden here, Naruto, said Blonde wasn't nearly as surprised to hear Demeter's voice, she had a good handle on her potent energies and could hide them when it suited her. Demeter. How are you? He would have asked why she was here if he believed it would have gotten a straight answer, too bad Demeter became evasive when he approached those sorts of questions. Things are good, but I do have a request, because Naruto let his focus remain on the tilled rows in front of him, he missed the woven basket hanging from Demeter's wrist that would have given away her intentions from the start. What is that? I can't offer much, that wasn't entirely true, but most of what he could provide would blow his cover, so those options were off the table, finally turning his head, it didn't take long for Naruto to put two and two together, ah, I see. How about sharing lunch with me? You can do that, right? Jiggling her wrist. Demeter made the brown basket dangling from her wrist sway enough to draw attention to it without risking the food balanced carefully within, after all, a meal ruining mishap at this stage would be more than upsetting. And that was how the relationship between sun and harvest grew, it came by small steps that alone were nothing special, but, over time, created a gradual connection between the two different deities. It was around this time that Naruto realized how much he valued a person's friendship, sure, he could always see Leto, but having more friends never hurt, and that's how he started to see Demeter despite the auspicious start to their relationship, she was flirty, yes, but also a friend. So when Naruto found Demeter asleep at the usual meeting spot, he thought nothing of it, she sure looks peaceful, like she was meant to be part of a place like this, he carefully stepped through the tiny field of golden grain around the tree base until he was in range to rouse her from her slumber. Naruto was unprepared for the onslaught of memory reflections that hauled him into something from Demeter's past, everything around him was tinted grey and echoed, but the content of the conversation in front of him was coherent enough for Naruto to understand. Don't you care about our child, Zeus? The familiar voice of Demeter might be refracted in his ears, yet Naruto could still hear the blend of anger and worry coming together in his ears. Of course, I care, Demeter. And you'd be wise to watch where you throw your accusations. The King of Olympus said one thing with his words, however, his facial countenance reflected none of the feelings he proclaimed to possess. Naruto had met stone with more emotion than Zeus showed. Are you even capable of telling the truth anymore? Or do only lies come off that tongue of yours? Apparently, Naruto wasn't alone in having doubts about the Thunderer and his authenticity. Demeter's motherly anguish slammed Zeus without restraint, and it was only growing stronger. If you cared for Persephone as I do, shed be here now, not trapped in that underground prison with our monster of a brother. The twitch in Zeus' furrowed brow was as subtle as one would think. It was twice as apparent as the flash of outrage filling his squinted gray eyes, Naruto could see snippets of truth behind the infamous king's temper, things are more complicated than that, and you know it. Right. Are these the same rules that stop you from taking another woman to your bed? Let's face it, you don't want our daughter back, you coward. Naruto didn't need a raging goddess to confirm it, 
most of the known world knew of Zeus' affinity for finding comfort outside his wife's bed, he really didn't understand how Hera put up with Zeus' crap. What did you say? With how quickly he exploded over the jab at him, Naruto was led to believe Zeus cared more about his reputation than his own flesh and ichor, it was a notion that dropped an acidic frown on the young Kami's face. You heard me. You pathetic excuse for a man. You're a sniveling coward. Instead of backing down from his fury, the mother of Persephone doubled down on her stance, and it was far from meek, just like the golden flush in her cheeks. Enough. He felt the displeasure in Zeus' voice through the trembling impact of the god's thunder going off somewhere in the distance, you want your daughter back? Demeter didn't find his stupid question worth a response, so Zeus got silence, her answer was painfully obvious. A stormy gaze was amplified by the methodical stroking of his chest-length beard, ill retrieve her from the underworld if you complete a task for me, his vague wording was a purposeful choice by the king, if he led Demeter into the task, he felt it absolved him of her meddling. Ill do anything to get my Persephone away from that monster. Admirable her goal might be, but that didn't make her blind agreement any less foolish, especially when dealing with a known pact breaker like Zeus. Your task is to find out anything you can about the man called Naruto. The unexpected addition of his name in their talks caused Naruto's golden eyes to expand out of shock, all of a sudden, their heated back and forth became more interesting. Naruto. Who is that? Demeter sported a look of confusion that was only second to the ethereal form of Naruto that hung over her right shoulder. Don't ask why. Just do as I say, Demeter, fine, but you better remember your words, Zeus. Thrown forcefully from the sleeping woman's memories, Naruto stumbled back without grace, experiencing a combination of surprise and grogginess left the usually sure-footed man vulnerable to a brief period of clumsiness. Naruto rebounded from his trance quickly enough, mentally and physically. Then the meaning of Demeter's actions caused his golden eyes to twist into a molten fury, she had been playing him for her own gain, he gave her a chance, and she burnt that bridge. The only reason he spared the woman from a life as a pile of golden ash was because of Persephone, begrudgingly, the young sun god understood where Demeter was coming from, there was little he wouldn't do for his family. I need to think, flashback end and that's why I looked like I ate a lemon when you brought up learning, I learned I can be a naive fool, sister, finally finished with the recollection of his story. Naruto took a well-earned breather, this pause also acted as a natural lapse where Nyx could digest the information Naruto shared with her. Her initial reaction was to rip Demeter and Zeus to shreds for messing with her baby brother, she chose to stomp that vengeful desire down for now, NYX's first priority was lifting Naruto's spirits, once she accomplished that, everything else could follow, the sun should never look so dim, especially her son. Naruto, waiting until she obtained his gaze, Nyx carefully selected her words, there was plenty to say in a short window, Naruto was still so young, and seeing him struggle with things like this was expected, but that's why he had people to help him with his troubles, your willingness to give people a chance, sometimes it will burn you, however, think of all the people you've helped because you held your hand out, that's reason for celebration, not self-ridicule. A small smile spread slowly over Naruto's lips without the young god realizing he was doing it, ha, huh, you're right, I tell myself that too, but it feels different coming from you, thanks. I needed to hear that, some of the things Nyx put forth were thoughts he kept to himself, but hearing them from the mouth of someone he respected added new credence to those whispers he told himself at night. The hug Naruto enclosed her lithe frame in was something Nyx was more than happy to return, anything for you, little brother, her warm-hearted reply was spoken into Naruto's shoulder as the older goddess held the hug as long as Naruto allowed. Eventually, all good things end and Naruto was looking at her with that typical beaming grin Nyx associated with him, Welp. Now that we got me straightened out, what do you have for me? It's something I need to tell and show you, I want you to come with me to the underworld. Every drop of positivity melted away, what was left was the kind of serious look that everyone from Zeus to Hades was wise to fear. Not that her reputation affected Naruto, knowing that Nyx could never hurt him kept Naruto from fearing his big sister, their relationship was built on love, not fear, is that all? Cool, let's go. I've always wanted to see the underworld. The gentle smile on NYX's pale face couldn't be contained, most people were wary of going to the Greco hell, deities included, however, Naruto didn't blink, he trusted her so completely, and that trust meant the world to Nyx. Nyx took Naruto's hands in hers, and both were sucked into the shadows pooling together at their feet. Underworld, night corridor when the darkness abated, Naruto laid eyes on something awe-inspiring, he ended up in the shadow of a rectangular building that went some 10 stories high and 100 yards wide, the design was unlike anything Naruto had seen before, plus, 
the bright yellow lights coming out the windows were a nice touch framed against the black backdrop of night corridor. Whoa. Who made this building? Nyx felt a warm pride wrap around her as Naruto's impression of her home became known to the goddess. I designed the motif myself. I call it, Victorian. Hold on, Naruto. Putting her hand on Naruto's shoulder, Nyx prevented the eager blonde from running into her house half-cocked. Maybe another time, we're heading to the back. That's when Naruto registered the dome of black glass. How he missed it, Naruto didn't know. The glass encasing was nearly as tall as the mansion itself, but what took the cake was the total sense of nothing it gave off. Naruto equated it to looking into a void or something similar. What I brought you here for is waiting for us in there. Follow me, please, under the stewardship of Nyx. The pair made the short trip through a spiraling shadow gate, and the first thing Naruto saw upon exiting was the being known as Thanatos. He had gray skin put upon effeminate features, along with silvered hair mostly hidden behind a black cowl. Thanatos had a comparatively thin figure, but that didn't deceive Naruto, who sensed death on the man like a second skin. Thanatos himself went on high alert until Nyx stepped between the two men. Thanatos, lower your weapon, you will hear me out before this escalates any further, and so, Nyx started explaining the complicated circumstances behind this meeting, most of which Naruto zoned out in favor of inspecting the glass shell from its interior. Naruto's focus was drawn away from the walls when a black symbol appeared in front of him, with it came a man pinned to a post by his wrists, hips, and ankles by some savage-looking spikes, ouch. The prisoner had an angry red skin and a pair of fangs that jutted out of his lower jaw and extended past his upper lip, whoever this man was also had more muscle on him than Naruto and Thanatos combined. I have dealt with this creature three times, but it won't stay dead, the blonde Kami whimsically acknowledged Thanatos' statement with a quiet hum as he wandered in for a closer examination. Maybe you ain't so potent, hermaphrodite. The bound brute had some less than kind remarks for the grey man, as the one responsible for his current predicament, Thanatos was a logical target for the prisoner's ire. What is it, Naruto? While her son frowned at the crude insult, Nyx concentrated on Naruto, who continued to stare at their guest with no shortage of scrutiny. His frown wasn't one created from worry over himself or for those in this room, Naruto had a lingering hunch that reached much further as he stared into the captive's bloodshot eyes, something that should NT be here, it's time you come out of your disguise, Naruto sent a pulse through his palm and into the creature's thrashing body. A shimmering light rippled across the red-skinned mon's body until the illusion was shattered, and he became something lichen-like with sparkling blue fur that shot irate jolts of lightning from the tips of said fur, as I expected, a raiju. Come again. Thanatos was clearly out of the loop, and it showed, Naruto didn't help him by refusing to answer the mundane questions asked, the blonde had bigger fish to fry. Similar to how Naruto recognized the beast, it went the other way around, and true to form, the broad smile of the raiju was wolfish, so it was you we felt? Yes, your blood will sat my thirst. Instead of falling prey to provocation, Naruto stared plainly at the known partner of one lightning god. Amaterasu's only child didn't even blink as the beast snapped its jaws at his face. Why are you here? Ha. Huh. I ain't telling you shit about shit. You heard the pale fool, Godaling. I can't be killed. What could you possibly do to me? Raiju's confidence was through the roof after hearing what the Greek Reaper had to say, however, like most indestructive beliefs, there was a way around it if one knew where to look. I have a theory about that, you see, I have something that Thanatos doesn't, it looks a little like this. The step Naruto took backward was more for flair than necessity, so was the choice to hold his arm out in front of him before summoning his spear, the fear in Raiju's gasp left Naruto with a smirk. El Lord Izanagi's weapon. Why do I you have that? Naruto didn't care that the fear filling the hound's eyes wasn't meant for him, either way, it was something Naruto could manipulate to get what he wanted from this lightning-based beast. So you still recognize my grandfather's weapon? Good, very good, Naruto was in complete control so you can bet the slip of his lineage was a conscious choice meant to deepen the worries festering in the static furred hound, names affected more than the everyday mortal, case and point. Grandson. The war between shock and fear was as apparent as Raiju's inability to keep his eyes from flicking back and forth between Naruto and the legendary spear in his hand. Imhum. A quick nod rattling his skull was all the confirmation he needed, which means I know what to do with Amanonahoko when the situation calls for it, Naruto twirled the legendary spear deftly. Ending the movement with the spearhead pointed right at one of Raiju's eyes, it was more than close enough to draw a flight or fight reaction. You don't have the guts. I can smell the good on you. Maybe it was surprising that the neutered wolf picked fight over flight, then again, as a partner of a god, it was expected that Raiju had some bite. True, 
I want enjoy it, but technically you don't belong here, so I will be doing the right thing, technically, securing the silence Naruto wanted was as simple as putting the spear to the wolf's vulnerable throat, the promise of death kept Raiju's nasty tongue penned behind a set of clenched teeth, I'll ask you once as a courtesy, tell me what you know, if you fail to comply, I'll shave you down one clump of flesh and fur at a time. Primal pride reared its ugly head, Raiju gathered what tenacity he had left and prepared a scathing retort, Naruto saw the defiant explosion coming, and ended it prematurely by extending a blade of light off Amanonohoko, when it drew blood, the beast wilted immediately, just like that, bravado turned into compliance, and the beast spilled, I just followed him here, I swear, he said we could take back a home for ourselves, have real bodies again. As a being with some control over life itself, Naruto was capable of reading hearts to an extent, what he picked up from Raiju was a quickened heartbeat sped up by fear, but Naruto couldn't find the notable tick that came with a lie. Good, with the truth, Naruto had all the information he needed. Thank you. You were a huge help. Naruto's gratitude became a spear through the chest, Raiju didn't have time to blink before its heart was destroyed, and his body burst into a crimson mist. The visual effect captured Naruto's attention as his spear vanished in a white light, so that's what a Shinto creature looks like when killed properly. Nice. Why did you do that? We could have gotten more from it. Part of Thanatos' displeasure came from the proof that Naruto could kill something he couldn't, for someone in his station, it really stung Thanatos' pride. I got everything I needed from the Raiju, you wouldn't know it, but Raiju were loyal servants to their lord and master, Raijin, the Shinto god of lightning. History lessons with chaos paid off big here, as soon as he confirmed it was a Raiju, Naruto knew who he was looking for, any other attempts at an interrogation would be a waste of his time. Wait. Mother said you were the only Shinto divine left. She's right, there were no kami left when I was born to my mother, and Raijin is not a god, not any longer, you see, it goes like this, turning around as his explanation continued, Naruto knew what he said next would surprise both underworld dwellers, Nix included, while Mother Knight was keyed into most of Naruto's culture and history, not even she knew it all. When someone from my pantheon fails to live up to our standards for behavior, they have their rights to Takamagahara our Olympus, revoked, the surprise on both of their faces was expected, Naruto had to assume they were imagining if such a thing were applied to their pantheon of ascended beings, Naruto imagined Olympus would be a very empty place indeed, they become an okite, a fallen, while the banished maintains their power, they are no longer considered divine, they're more akin to a beast or demon at this point. Where is he, Naruto? Nyx would step out of her shadows if needed to make sure this rogue element was stopped, she knew her pantheon didn't need any extra help driving itself to failure, their paranoid king did that well all on his own. What place is most like home on this planet for someone like me? The question only had one or two real answers, thankfully, that removed the need for elaboration. The Far East, Nix was right on the money in a single guess, not that Naruto expected any less from his older sister. Yup. I am gonna go see what I can dig up before things get too bad, I'll see you soon, sis, as he made his exit. Naruto picked up the faint sound of Nyx forcing a vow of secrecy on Thanatos, one sworn on the name of Chaos, it left Naruto smiling and laughing, his sister could be a real mother hen, but Naruto wouldn't have it any other way. Northern Yamato, Northern Japan, 3, that is how many of Reijin's Raiju Naruto worked through before getting a workable estimate of where his target was operating, looking back with hindsight, he should have assumed ITD be Northern Yamato, it was the furthest from outside influence, and the rocky landscape ensured Raijin was closer to the sky, closer to his lightning. Once he knew where to search, it wouldn't be long before Naruto tracked the banished god down, it's not like Raijin went out of his way to cover his tracks, godly energies aside, Naruto smelled the thick scent of ozone in the mountainous air, that was as clear a sign as any. Finishing the last stretch of his hike through the uneven mountain ground, Naruto looked to the mountaintop, the snow kept getting in his way, but it was no worry of Naruto's, the falling snow continued to melt as soon as it came in contact with the blonde's skin. Once he finally scaled the mountain, Naruto set his plans in motion, that meant releasing a small portion of his power, it was enough to grab attention without revealing the true depths of his power. The response to his challenge came less than a second later, when the flash of lightning hit the lumpy mountain hump in front of him, Naruto found himself squinting, you, it's you, the one we have been searching for, and you came to me, how lucky. The heir to Amaterasu quickly noted the only physical difference between Raijin and his Raiju imposters were the drums floating behind his back in the eyes, while his lightning pets had pupils, Raijin's eyes were nothing but a pair of sparking, violet pits. Naruto paid the thick laughter coming his way no mind, 
same as the veiled threats to his well-being, Reijin, acting quickly, Naruto angled his body to dodge a pair of hurled lightning bolts, the third in the salvo was the one Naruto batted aside with a fire-encased hand. The two adversaries ignored the resulting thrums of thunder, neither was willing to take their eyes off the man across the mountain, eventually, the large-bodied Reijin ended the silent standoff, I don't need your words, I need your death, this time he gathered a bolt of lightning as large as a horse over his head, and this time, Naruto needed both hands to throw the projectile directly above him. Reijin stared at the grey clouds overhead as an ear-shattering explosion rained down on them, snarling, sparks of lightning burst off his hand, Kaminari Shurio, lightning hunting. A dazzling beast made of pure lightning jumped out of Reijin's hand, landing on all fours, connected to it by a leash of light, Reijin silently commanded the construct to attack, and so it did. It twisted and turned, leaping off the peaks with otherworldly agility as it approached Naruto, instead of crashing into the blonde from the front, it swerved and tried biting at Naruto's left, Naruto saw it coming and turned to put a mirror-shaped flame barrier to fend off the creature's supercharged jaw. With Naruto facing left, Reijin unleashed a second manifestation from his free hand, he aimed it at Naruto's blindside, but when it reached the unprotected flank, Reijin allowed himself a smirk, it lasted until the lightning beast went through Naruto and exploded against the ground. Stellar projection clones, they make for such lifelike decoys, don't you agree? Naruto permitted Reijin enough time to turn and face him before a fiery explosion sent the muscled man soaring off the mountain. Naruto didn't let his flames spread for long, he quickly contained them in a globe around him until it looked like a miniature sun sat on the mountain, he sent the ball of fire with himself in the center, tumbling through the atmosphere with a single leap, and when he crashed down where Reijin hit, the impact unleashed a scorching shockwave on the immediate vicinity. Sitting on one knee, Naruto's brow furrowed in annoyance as more thunder shattered the sky, it was plenty loud, enough to shake Naruto's ichor. When Naruto stood, he was already looking around for Reijin, the okite was there when Naruto jumped but was gone by the time Naruto landed, he had enough time to look left, right, then up when Naruto realized something wasn't right, it wasn't just quiet, he was deafened. The temporary removal of his hearing put the golden-eyed god on high alert, Naruto hated it, but he resorted to reacting, it became clear he had enough time to face Reijin's heavy strikes but not enough for a counter. For three long minutes, Naruto was helplessly smacked around like a heavy bag, never had 180 seconds felt like an eternity, thankfully his period of weakness ended with Naruto flat on his back and some golden blood running down his chin. He's faster than me, but he can only come one way when I am like this, from above, and he was right, Reijin descended on his prone form with his fingers extended and lightning screaming around his outstretched hand, the bastard planned on stabbing him. Yeah, that wouldn't work for Naruto. Putting his hands side by side with the palms facing out, he met the charging Reijin with a beam of golden fire large enough to swallow the muscular fallen's body, but to Naruto's dismay, the flames didn't stop a violet-colored discrepancy from pushing through toward his body. Back off. Naruto growled indignantly as a second surge of fire coursed forward and sent Reijin into the sky, he took a breath before creating a small flame behind the soaring brute, gathering his wits, Naruto teleported to the newly made fire just as Reijin reached his apex, already in position to attack, he double stomped Reijin in the spine, driving the man into the ground hard enough that it knocked up a dust cloud. FWOOSH. Boom. Naruto was the first to emerge from the cloud, unsurprisingly, he already had one fireball floating over each of his hands as he waited to see if Reijin was still conscious, he kicked the lightning drummer hard enough to snap his spine, but with gods, ya never know, and soon enough, the burly Kami pushed his snow-stained body out of the upheaval Naruto planted him in. Furious over his injury at the hands of this child, a feeble spark escaped Reijin's panting mouth, then without warning, his drums vibrated on their own accord, the bass heavy beat unleashed a flurry of lightning strikes in the distance, as the bolts approached and the thunder got louder, Naruto realized something was wrong. Shit. This isn't an instant technique, he's charging up for something. Naruto hurriedly tried putting enough power together to break Reijin's concentration, whether or not he made it in time was up in the air. That's when the ground under their feet shook violently, it was like being in an earthquake multiplied by a thousand. Both men fought to keep their balance as the world under their feet shuddered frightfully, when the dueling pair realized this was an outside force their battle stopped, being the closest to the quake's epicenter, Reijin turned right as something massive tore its way out of the planet's crust. What in the name of Amaterasu? With distance, the stunned Naruto saw an endless sea of scales rising into the sky, and when they did give way, Naruto wished they hadn't, because that's when he crossed gazes with a haunting pair of sickly yellow eyes, 
It was bigger than massive, it was titanic, and the rattling hiss it released froze both fighters in place. Moving faster than Naruto could ever imagine from a beast of its size, the snake lashed out and crashed its absurd jaws on Reijin's position. Naruto couldn't help but wince at the scream Reijin uncorked when the snake sunk its human sized fangs into his bulky body. Ga! No, brother! Help me, please, brother! Imagine the dreadful shock Naruto experienced when the snake crushed Reijin in its jaws and swallowed the extremely powerful god like a common rodent. Naruto wasn't ashamed to admit he took a cautious step back. That's when another seven heads fanned outward, emerging from the hazy cloud of dust behind the serpent. Each of them leered at Naruto with a menacing harmony of hissing growls. The complete visual of the great beast made the sunspawn's blood run cold. Yamada no Orochi, its eyes are like a kakagachi. It has one body with eight heads and eight tails, moreover. On its body grows moss and also camisiparis and cryptomerias. Its length extends over eight valleys and eight hills and if one looks at its belly. It is all constantly bloody and inflamed. Naruto repeated the myth he was told as a boy under his breath, though the tail was twisted over time, as most are. The overwhelming scale of the beast was spot on. This was the Yamada no Orochi lording over him, and the golden-haired heir to the sun never felt so inconsequential. Naruto had to question how his uncle thought something like this alone, for a month straight, no less. His brain screamed run, and Naruto nearly obliged, that was until his heart found its resolve to stand firm. If he let this monster run amuck, it would ravage the land without opposition, causing unspeakable pain to the mortals, and he'd be the one to blame because he ran away. No, Naruto wasn't going to let that happen, great beast or not, he was no coward. Bright flames surrounded the god from the hips down, with their aid, Naruto became a walking spew of blistering fire. Using the speed increase from this partial transformation, he launched himself at Orochi, smashing a flaming fist into one of the snake's many faces. Immediately, Naruto realized the blow didn't land as cleanly as he would have liked. Clicking his teeth, he bounced off the titanic serpent, tumbling backwards through the air. Naruto expelled a fire jet, jerking his body to the left and away from a snapping jaw. He had no plans on joining Reijin in the creature's bottomless stomach. Naruto rode his momentum left, tossing a searing blaze into the nearest snake face, but all it did was draw forth an annoyed hiss and some steam, his attack was frustratingly ineffective against his scaled opponent. He wasn't afforded time to be surprised, Naruto was instantly on the defensive, weaving back and forth between a lunging tangle of serpent heads that sought to devour him, his evasive maneuvers ended up taking Naruto into the sky, it took nearly 500 feet of distance for the young god to be safe from the ancient beast. I need more. A vestige of divine essence rippled across Naruto's steadfast figure, ending with the god Spawn wearing a brand new outfit, his new golden jacket exuded life force generated flames that shone over the top of a black bodysuit, which was decorated with nine gilded magatama around the collar and a golden ring over his stomach, Naruto's hair emitted the same brilliant splendor with two tufts extending into horn-like appendages, one. The change also took a toll on the Omakami's physical body, namely his eyes, instead of having white backgrounds, his orbs were filled black, and the only break in the ebony voids were the golden dots in them, his pupils, which shrunk to the size of a marble, if blunt force won't cut it, it'll just pierce you, snake. His shiny aura extended further off Naruto's body until it went white near the edges, with some concentration, he whittled it down until his manifested fires sharpened into a lengthy spear, Mabeui Yari, radiant lance. Naruto burned an arch-shaped pathway of light into the sky as he attacked. His trajectory was completed with a severe nosedive at the timeless reptile. On the way down, three different heads took a pass at Naruto, but he was too fast for their bites to land, they tasted air while he soldiered down on the thick-bodied beast, when the dangerous point of the god-driven spear hit the snake, his momentum died on impact, the shudder from colliding with Orochi passed through Naruto's body, but the blonde wasn't one to be deterred easily, just as Naruto started exerting himself, another head slammed into Naruto's ribs, throwing him aside. He corrected his trajectory before he crashed into the ground, his golden pupils shrunk, then Naruto flashed away with a crackle of burning wood, the divine fighter teleported to the burnt grass near Orochi's gut, where he counted on the engorged underbelly being far less durable to outward trauma, so that's where he needed to attack. Both parties unleashed an attack at the same time, it was a vigilant head that lunged at Naruto from his blind side, aware that he wouldn't land his blow in time, Naruto pulled his arm back and jumped. Naruto skipped back like a hurled stone until he evacuated the space around the multi-necked reptile, in doing so, he carved out a burnt path in the ground until he stopped some 30 yards away, fuck, it's fast. The winds going through him caught Naruto off guard, he grabbed at his left bicep, 
where the pain originated from, it wasn't visible under his cloak, but he sure felt it, while he escaped a fate similar to Raijin, Naruto didn't get away unscathed. I need to be faster. This time calling on his powers came with an unexpected consequence, it felt like something clenched angrily around his immortal heart when his energies flexed, unbridled pain caused Naruto's body to seize up and his cloak to disperse in a shower of fading embers, golden god blood was spat up before he realized what was happening to him, poison, and a nasty one at that. First, he channeled his reserve power into burning out the foreign substance, he never made step two because the ground under his feet rattled ominously, even a moment's hesitation would have meant being swallowed, instead, Naruto dodged the mouth by taking to the sky, however, that took him directly into a volley of venomous spew from another poised serpent maw. A globe of bright flame encompassed Naruto, safeguarding him while the holy fires eradicated the new poison before it could damage the blonde any further, having no plans of becoming a free meal when his defense faded, he wasted no time teleporting to a safe spot, Naruto picked where Orochi's tails should have been, thanks, Oji-san. Naruto attempted to push his advantage while the snake had its huge back turned, but his effort ended when another wave of pain hit, only this time around, it was much worse, his body went limp, and it took all he had to land on a knee instead of his face, but as Naruto did, there was the violent coughing that spat up sullied Ikor. His rash creation of 50 clones was done to protect himself, but also because Naruto panicked a little, for someone who routinely created north of a thousand, this poison-induced limit was frustrating, when the multi-headed monster finally turned around, it saw an army of blondes waiting for it, the amassed godlings rose in a single, defiant mob, their mission was clear, given to them through the mental link they shared with the original. If we can't break the scales from the outside, then we attack from within, keep one of the mouths open for me. The manufactured horde of sun gods initiated a prolonged series of hit and run attacks on their temporarily shocked enemy, their efforts were as clear as the rapid flashes of gold which danced around the thrashing snake's body, speed and change of direction became the preferred methods of snake fang avoidance, it took 20 butchered clones before one of the duplicates scored a snap kick that turned an open mouth to the real Naruto. Eat this, bastard. Every stimulus in his body heightened at once, nearly overwhelming him. The tunnel vision came as his heart rate exploded with self-made anticipation. Naruto's blood was roaring, ready to lash out like the attack sitting in his hand, Rasentayogan, spiraling sun sphere. His latest attack was a hand-sized firebomb maintained around a violently rotating core. He lunged at his foe's open maw intent on blowing up its skull in one fell swoop. The sweet satisfaction of victory was ripped from Naruto's hands when the solar sphere stopped an inch short of the target, Naruto tried everything to close the distance, but his struggles amounted to nothing, soon, the Rasentayogan's better than gold shine faded along with the attack, meanwhile, its creator looked down to find another of Orochi's heads holding him by the ankle, finding out the reason his attack failed caused Naruto's morale to plummet. No. Let me he was summarily whipped aside, treated like nothing more than common trash, the clones watched their maker be disposed of and changed tactics, they mustered as much power as possible and went on the attack, hoping to buy Naruto some recovery time, from his prone position, all he saw were the explosions of light, that and the bursts of heat that crawled over his skin from the clone-fed rampage. I need more power if I want to win, but if I divert any energy from poison management, I'll lose, damn it, was the poison's influence making him delirious, or did it hurt to think? That couldn't be a good sign could it? Is it getting dark? With that fleeting thought, Naruto's eyes closed with a muted groan. They only stayed shut for a second before his eyes snapped open, and a soft smile unfolded on his face, you fought well, my child, let me assist you with this pest. This voice came from his body but wasn't Naruto's, it was distinctly more feminine. Moving mechanically but without issue, the injured deity stood once more, that's when an ebony eruption of flame jumped out of Naruto's infected laceration, cauterizing the wound instantly. It was also around now that the sunmark put on Naruto by chaos started glowing through his tattered clothing, now that the poison was purged from his system, Naruto turned his attention back to the oversized pest, you harmed my son, beast, burn. After establishing her identity through a series of statements, Amaterasu infused her son with her own willpower, temporarily taking control, and she saw no better target for her motherly fury than the beast her brother exterminated centuries ago, she had a treasure trove of questions, but this was no time to ask them. Naruto's safety was Amaterasu's primary concern, and it always will be, I said, burn. Mirroring how Naruto triggered some of his techniques, a snap of the fingers caused a growing flame to erupt on the snake's head, it wasn't long before Orochi's whole skull went up in a blistering inferno, the revitalized cries of pain that followed only deepened Amaterasu Naruto's smile, if Orochi wanted to make her sunshine suffer, 
ITDs suffer tenfold. The heads lucky enough to be spared the black fire regarded Naruto with growing unease, they decided to withdraw, diving for the pit hole it created upon first arriving on the scene, it was a choice to retreat from the threat posed by Amaterasu Naruto. Now that the threat was taken care of, Amaterasu allowed a gentler smile to show through Naruto's face, the parental pride couldn't be measured nor contained by mere words, but Amaterasu said it anyways, let's take you somewhere safe before my fleeting control fades, I am proud of you, my sunshine. The previously soothed features on Naruto's face scrunched up moments before the blonde stirred from his sleep, his eyes fluttered open, and instantly the young warrior went on high alert, the difference between day and night was as clear as the towering Torii gate looming over Naruto, wait a minute, where am I? Getting knocked out hadn't stopped Naruto from remembering what happened to him. Although he was comparatively young, Naruto was no fool, there wasn't a world where the bloodthirsty Yamada no Orochi would allow its unconscious prey to escape, that meant someone or something must have saved him from an untimely end, only Naruto didn't know who or why, it could have been a purposeful choice or a stretch of dumb luck, either way, the whole situation left Naruto feeling sour. But at least he couldn't feel the poison coursing through his veins anymore, a silver lining, I suppose. His somewhat decent mood continued heading south as Naruto recalled his bout with the snake, I was an idiot to think ITD be slow because of its size, I know a handful of creatures that are big and fast, dumbass, with the benefit of hindsight, Naruto already picked out several spots where he could have performed better, as an unrepentant brawler, his lackluster performance damaged his pride as a fighter. That had always been an issue of his the fight between expectations and reality, Chaos, Nyx, and Meg all approached him about his extremely high standards, but the drive to better wasn't something Naruto could just turn off. Naruto's pensive silence ended when Naruto spat out an irritable plume of fire, tucking both hands behind his head, he flopped onto his back with a sigh, well, there's no reason to cry about it now, however, I ain't dead, so this ain't over, Orochi, not by a long shot, Naruto wouldn't stop until that thrice damned serpent burned under his flames. Gently tapping the back of his scalp with his thumbs, Naruto found himself lost in the starry sky above, such unblemished beauty made it easy to gather his thoughts into something cohesive, scales can wait, I remember Raijin calling for his brother, if I am going to believe him, that suggests the windy one is somewhere around here too, and I can't head back west until I deal with things here. His idle inspection of the sky eventually led Naruto to the moon in all its silvery splendor. There was just something about the moon tonight, even obscured in a half covering of clouds, the lunar shine was bewitching, it transfixed Naruto, soothed him too, he couldn't say why if someone asked, but he just started talking aloud, Eno, people think my powers are weaker when you're watching me, I don't feel that way, no, I am more focused and in control, it's a good vibe, like I am at peace, and nothing else matters. Naruto could have gone on and on with this spontaneous admission to the moon had he not yawned, that gesture alone enlightened Naruto to how tired he really was, both mentally and physically, whoever claimed gods don't need sleep is full of it, I've never felt more exhausted in my entire life, the blonde did his best to fend off the heaviness weighing down his eyelids as he rubbed his bare chest, but it was a losing fight. One yawn turned into an avalanche of them until he had one that stretched his jaw far enough to make Naruto wince, after the pain subsided, his eyes closed, ill look for the windbag in the morning, I need some sleep, badly, keep an eye out for me, Tasuki chan The chance of saying anything else eluded Naruto, who fell into the seductive embrace of sleep. He could face his trials in the morning, southern island, five days later. The cyclical tides continued pushing through the shoreside cavern, creating an ambient whistle that fit the burrow nicely, it was a hymn that went hand in hand with the ethereal blue glow reflecting off the sleek cave walls, however, this beauty was a cover for something else, two men met here to discuss something dubious at best. Yet the barren cave amplified even the hushest of whispers into a clearly stated proclamation, making the conversation impossible to miss. HMPH, I thought you said that brainless brute could be counted on when the time came. He's two days late, Fujin san, we are 48 hours behind schedule at a time where every second counts, anyone with half a brain would hear the raging battle between frustration and patience playing out in the mon's voice. Sujin was once the Shinto water god, but he didn't dress like the typical divine being his ensemble lacked flash and substance entirely, such was the consequence of wearing a plain cloak that spanned his shoulders down to his ankles, but apart from that, Sujin adorned himself with a black cap, which covered his straight, blue hair, those same azure-shaded locks were slicked back, by the way. The figure across from Sujin came with green hair and a pointed beard, this was one of his partners in crime, Fujin, unlike his fellow fallen being, 
the wind god was garbed in a full suit of samurai armor, complete with sigils of his sacred animal on each shoulder plate, and hanging from his hips were two identical sheaths, both were empty and left clattering off Fujin's metal suit whenever the displaced former deity moved with any force. My brother thinks more with his muscles than his brain, true, but he won't fail me when it counts, he won't let us down, if Raijin is delayed, I believe he has a good reason for it, hell show up, he always does, Sujin san. His experience in dealing with some of Raijin's antics was paying off, no one else would be able to keep their composure at a time like this, they'd be sitting in the same irritable boat as Sujin. Your faith in him is all well and good, if our plan didn't hinge on everything moving forward together. You secured the gateways while I handled the creation of our bases, meanwhile, it was up to Raijin San to herd and subdue the monsters that crossed the boundary, even one missing piece puts the whole operation in jeopardy. Sujin threw some additional information to stress the importance of unilateral punctuality from all parties, they were far enough into their plan that one misstep could threaten everything they hoped to accomplish. Fujin held his tongue to avoid coming back with an unchecked bout of frustration, the last thing either needed was a useless squabble adding complications to their already precarious situation. I understand what you're saying, Sujin, but there isn't anything we can do short of blindly searching for him, or perhaps we should ask the boss for assistance. I mean, we already got. The sea-haired gentleman raised a hand, silencing his samurai comrade before the suggestion reached fruition. Wordlessly, Sujin turned to the cave's water supply and knelt in front of it, where he sunk his fingers into the shallow pool. Feeling through the ripples with his knuckles, Sujin attempted to find why his alarms were being tripped. We have an uninvited guest among us, keep your eyes up. He's here Naruto turned Sujin into a prophet by appearing in front of the man and driving his fist straight into Sujin's surprised face. The former water god couldn't react in time as the raw force in Naruto's punch sent Sujin deeper into the cave, said Blonde wasted no time taking Fujin by the skull and flashing out of the den, separating his enemies. A frigid-eyed Naruto watched the fallen deity drop to his knees with a gasp, it would appear that Fujin wasn't built for Naruto's preferred method of traveling, seeing how it left the man in a coughing fit, get up and fight, okite, or it'll put you down like a rabid animal, the current iteration of Amaterasu's child was all business a lingering side effect of crossing paths with Orochi. Fujin felt his stand on end, not unlike an animal with its hackles raised in warning, the older man showed visible panic in his olive eyes and was something Naruto isolated, how do you know that name? Who in Yomi's name are you? The flippant reminder of his status as an over-glorified monster didn't help Fuijin's rapidly deteriorating mood. Naruto wasn't about to give the green-headed fallen the kind of answers he wanted, you don't belong here, therefore. I am here to remove you like any other cancer that needs correcting, it's how the world works, nothing personal. Fujin would explain this stubborn sensation in him as a gut feeling. There was something wedged in his soul telling him the person responsible for Raijin's disappearance was standing in front of him, planning on forcing the answers out of Naruto. The wind god went on the attack, Fujin armed himself by swiping his hands over the empty sheaths, creating and drawing two wind swords in a single movement, and while Fujin was quick, he wasn't reaching the same level of speed Raijin showed in his fight with Naruto. This allowed Naruto to follow the wind-based weapon as it came slashing down on his head before he counterattacked. It was as simple as superheating the air creating the sword until Fujin's blade exploded in his hand, the rattling explosion didn't stop Fujin from following up with his other weapon. His stab attempt ended with the same result, an explosion of sound, smoke, and flames, when the air pollution parted, Naruto was gone with it, Fujin didn't think to look up until he sensed a shift in the wind patterns above his head, and that was when Fujin saw Naruto dropping out of the sky with his flaming fist cocked back. He jumped back, or he tried to, things didn't play out like that. Not with Naruto grabbing Fujin by his ankle and dragging him back into a body-folding gut punch, blood flew from the wind manipulator's mouth, however, more worrying was the building orange glow in Naruto's mouth, it culminated in the golden-eyed deity breathing literal fire onto a helpless Fujin. The force behind his flames launched Naruto's target back, and as the burning man sailed away screaming, his metal suit scorched the vulnerable flesh underneath. A self-contained tornado hit the back, dumping a whipping sand funnel onto the fire that illuminated the beach, with the flames doused, Fujin freed himself, but the damage had been done, not only was the fallen god's armor hissing orange, but the mon's hair was burned away, exposing all the heat bruises, and burns marking his skin. How do you like that one? It's not creative but it's pretty damn effective, if I had to give it a name, I'd call it, Ryu no Ibuki, Dragon's Breath, so, what do you think? A scowl pulled heavily on Fujin's face as he heard Naruto make light of him as a potential threat. Intent on teaching Naruto why mocking him was a mistake, 
The windy one thrust forward thanks to a pair of cyclones under his feet. The flush of wind moving against Fujin's blistering skin caused debilitating pain, but the burnt fallen refused to stop his charge. Faster than the human eye could follow, he was in front of the blonde with his new swords crossing at Naruto's neck in an attempt to behead the sun god. Too bad his body wasn't answering his commands. W what trickery is T this? I respect the tradition and beauty of sword fighting. There's an elegance to it, but there is a major flaw, like knowing where you have to be to land a hit, that leaves you open to traps. Fujin, as Naruto shared his monotonous thoughts, a massive seal glowed white on the sandy ground around the two Shinto men. Mahi Bunya, Paralysis Field. Naruto strode forward, placing himself within two feet of his immobilized enemy, who the blonde stared down with his arms crossed tightly over his chest. Tell me what you're doing here and how you ended up in this dimension. Why would I do that, you f fool? If he were able, Fujin would have laughed in Naruto's face for making such a stupid request, but as things stood, he was having a hard enough time getting words out of his mouth, so had settled for simple replies. The young Mons response came without a hitch, hardly bothered by the unfettered hostility thrown at him from his captive, if you give me what I want, I will tell you where your brother is, that's the trade I am offering. How do I know your tea telling the truth? Going off his spiteful gaze, it was evident that Fujin wanted nothing more than to see Naruto's premature end, preferably at his hands, but at the moment, Fujin was held at Naruto's mercy. With the freedom of being in control, Naruto could do things like shrug nonchalantly, you can't be sure, doesn't change the fact that you have to decide if Reijin's life is worth the risk you're taking, that is how ultimatums work, and now it was time to kick back and monitor how the pressure played on Fujin's resolve. The conflict raging within the trapped man was as plain as the nose sitting on his face, eventually, he invoked a singular reply that he spat at Naruto, fine, and it wasn't a choice the fallen Shinto looked pleased making. How did you get here? Naruto spent the silent moments between searching for any twitches that d give up what Fujin was thinking, and what are you doing now that you are here? Fujin was deprived of the chance to share anything with Naruto when a kunai punctured his skull from behind, depriving him of his life. The throw had enough force to leave the kanai's point emerging from Fujin's forehead. Naruto's eyes widened as the kanai bubbled up before exploding, taking off the fallen wind god's head with a bang, splattering Naruto with tainted once ichor. A nonplussed blonde smeared the blood from his face while Fujin's headless body slowly deteriorated into a crimson mist. Fantastic, Naruto muttered his complaint, shifting his focused gaze to the interruption source, a perfectly calm Sujin. And of all things to start with, it was a sanctimonious statement rife with overconfidence, worry not. You shall share the same fate as my traitorous ally, all in due time. Sujin endeavored to surprise Naruto with a kanai from his billowing sleeve, but the golden blonde tilted his head out of the kanai's way, his lazy dodge got a scoff from Sujin, HMPH. Looking to close the distance, Naruto emptied a barrage of heavy punches and targeted kicks on the waterman, but Sujin proved to have a solid defensive stance, which helped him block most of his opponent's attacks, they ended up locked together with Naruto's fists trapped in Sujin's grip, all brute strength and no thought, just like your incompetent bitch of a mother. The unwelcomed insult to Amaterasu sparked anger in Naruto's luminous golden eyes, when he responded, there wasn't any overwhelming power, nor did he break out some sly tactic, the young god did something totally unexpected when he slammed his forehead into the prick's nose, snapping Sujin's head back wasn't enough for Naruto, he tackled Sujin to the sand and unloaded on the stunned Mon's face. Naruto landed three satisfying punches before a swell of water blasted him from behind. Both men clambered back to their feet, one with a bruised face and the other covered in ichor and clumps of wet sand. You fight like a brigand, the persistent twinges of pain in his jaw were inflamed by the mere act of speaking, his discomfort cemented the perpetual glare worn on the blue-haired Okite's face, it was clear to Naruto that this wasn't someone who was used to the struggle of close quarters combat, Naruto, however, was more than ready to take a punch if that's what it took. Oh yeah? Fuck you, asshole. Usually, Naruto happily partook in a bit of battle banter, it made things more interesting than just grunting and yelling, however, most people didn't make the fatal mistake of calling his beloved Ka-chan a bitch. Charming. An explosive volley of water went Naruto's way, only to be stopped by the blonde's fires, the two opposing elements met head-on and engaged in a struggle for supremacy, the process was slow, but Naruto was gaining the upper hand, upon seeing this, Sujin added a second surge of water to his offensive. Aware that this was a losing battle, Naruto cut his attack short with a click of his teeth, the solar god quickly jumped away before Sujin could do any damage, taking up a new angle upon landing, Naruto thrust both hands forward this time, doubling the amount of firepower at his disposal. 
It still wasn't enough to shake Sujin, who laughed off Naruto's attempt, predictable. Seeing the younger Mons attack off was as simple as raising a hand for Sujin. The following swell of water from the sea was four times larger than what Naruto managed, with the ocean powering him. Sujin routed the flames in seconds. This time Sujin was much closer to landing an attack, but Naruto still managed to get out of the way in time. A deep breath from Naruto left his chest puffed out. He quickly turned that action into an exhale, which spread a field of glittering fire orbs that spanned the whole sandbar. Sujin examined the minefield around him with a frown that creased his face. As soon as Naruto clicked his teeth, a ravaging wave of explosions tore across the beach, blanketing it in bright light. A massive wall of water shot into the sky from somewhere in the chaos. No doubt it was Sujin's attempt to protect himself from the barrage of blasts. When the rotating barrier of seawater dropped, it exposed the smug smirk plastered to Sujin's bruised face. Your attempts are futile. You can't beat me this close to the ocean. I am invincible. The boastful sound of his voice carried over the whole beach, much to the blonde's annoyance. Save your victory speech until you beat me, dumbass. It doesn't matter if it's now or later. The difference is the same. You shall fall to me here. Sujin manipulated the back and forth to mask his next move, because behind Naruto, a handful of aqua knives rose out of the foamy brine of the sea. They silently hovered until Sujin commanded them to shoot at Naruto's back. Despite a lack of tells, Naruto fell to his stomach and avoided the surprise attack. Sujin frowned as his stealth knives soared over the space Naruto once filled. He hastily motioned for the kanai to make a U-turn, but this time, the water weapons were stopped by an eight-sided mirror of pure light, which Naruto summoned by clapping his hands together, smirking at Sujin's shocked expression. Naruto returned the absorbed attack to its sender, however, it came out as a white light laser, the speed of it was too fast for Sujin to react to, costing him a puncture hole in his right shoulder. Gah! Invincible, huh? Naruto jumped on the chance to mock the man holding onto his bleeding wound, he wrung plenty of satisfaction in harming the fool that dared insult his beloved Ka-san. The only reason you are annoying is the ocean, it is doing all the heavy lifting. Insolent whelp. A looping belt of water rose around Sujin's waist, from this circular garter extended eight tendrils that whipped about frantically, I shall enjoy snuffing you out, sun spawn. Yo. Everything's good to go, boss, the blonde godling refrained from grinning, though the temptation was definitely there, the clone he sent off when Sujin hid behind his wall was now in place and ready to spring the trap, you clones are the best idea I've ever had. With the clone's happy laughter filling his head, the real Naruto once again regarded the blue-haired asshole with his smoldering golden orbs, let me tell you something, asshole, I own every note my mother and uncles ever wrote, there were some passages on you and the other elementals, I know everything they knew about you, you weren't what we consider powerful, not even in your prime, which is a far cry from what you are now, beast. Sujin's pale face burned ruby as he boiled in place thanks to Naruto's comment, someone like him being compared to something as lowly as a beast. The thought was outright preposterous. Those are but lies propagated by your accursed lineage. I shall end their slander with your death, thus restoring what was rightfully mine. Divinity. There it is, the ambition that banished you from Takamagahara, your position wasn't entitled. It was earned through actions, and it was a test you failed. Let that greed be what seals your eternal fate, Sujin no Okite, coming down to a debate of personal theology. Naruto despised the greed Sujin harbored, Sujin thought everything was his right, while Naruto believed in using his gifts to help others, activate it. Activate what? What a clueless Sujin couldn't know was this remark was meant for the clone waiting at the mouth of the cave, it was a clone with the almighty spear, Amanonahoko, laid between his hands and buried in the sandy shore. Taking what energy it had left, the clone's body shone brightly before its light was sucked into the spear and spiraled into the beach, saturating it with Naruto's brand of potent godliness. Reconnecting with his energy was a simple task, he used that power to shape the hard soil far under the battle-stained sands into something useful. Naruto sculpted it into a spherical prison that engulfed Sujin and launched into the sky. Enjoy the sky, sea urchin. Sujin saw confusion shift into the uglier emotion called fury. He took this meager attempt at imprisonment as an insult of the highest order. The fuming fallen fighter put his hands against the warm rock, preparing to punch a rupture into this barren trap. One burst is all it should take. What? He felt his powers flare up within, but in the same breath, he sensed the rocks housing him soak whatever essence he supplied, growling. Sujin tried three more times before he began desperately slamming against the rocks holding him in place. Back on the beach, Naruto's lips flexed upward at the influx of energy he felt building in the rocky shell, you won't be breaking free with that level of power, he shot up into the sky on a tail of flames, 
landing gracefully on the top of the sphere. From there, a mess of flame shreds started gathering in his palm. You won't be doing anything at all, bastard. More and more flames formed in Naruto's hand, bringing a resurgence of light that never shone brighter than when Naruto lifted his hand overhead, give me more. The Resentaiyogan kept growing in size until it dwarfed both Naruto and the sphere, then it shrunk to the size of a pebble while sweat dribbled down Naruto's temple and evaporated into harmless steam. Naruto chiseled an opening for himself, he flicked the condensed sun bomb into the orb, and instead of waiting around to see what happened, Naruto shot back into the sky on two jets of fire. This let Naruto watch the earthen prison light up from within before a blistering emulsion lit up the mid-afternoon sky. When the glow faded, what was left was Naruto overseeing a rain of ashes, enjoy your all expenses paid trip to Yomi, asshole, courtesy of Naruto Omakami. Meanwhile, the Greek world was about to undergo a terrible change. War, Thea, Greece weddings were meant to be joyous affairs, or so we are told, however, even at such a party, not everyone is fortunate enough to be happy. I am sorry but I can't let you in there, Aris, out of all the poor souls in attendance, Hermes drew the unenviable task of Dorman, even now, the thieving god didn't know why his father selected him as the man to tell the discord spreading deity no, but this was the duty given to him by his lord father, Zeus, Hermes couldn't say no. Through her curtain of draping black hair, Aris handed the speedster a look that could melt Hephaestus' forge, Hermes wasn't ashamed to admit he flinched under such blatant feminine fury, you're telling me I am not welcome at a wedding ceremony open to the gods? Why yes? Outwardly, Hermes exhibited a nervous chuckle that caused a single curly tuft of hair to wiggle on his forehead, internally it was a whole other story, on the inside, where it was safe, Hermes cursed a storm and asked why Apollo couldn't deal with this terrifying woman, then he'd be the one to enjoy all the booze put on display. It appeared curses were popular on the day because Aris went on to uncork an impressively long chain of curse words that only furthered Hermes' discomfort, when she paused to breathe, Aris went into her extravagant robes for something, here it is, my gift, enjoy. Coming out with a golden apple bigger than either god's head, Lady Discord held the fruit with both hands and threw it overhead into the party, where it rolled into feast until its inscription was left face up for the world to see. Calliste to the fairest with the seed planted, an irate Aris flew off to who knows where, Hermes moved to collect whatever discourse she left in her wake, at least until he saw who the golden apple of discord attracted, Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite all had this look in their eye, it wouldn't do him any favors, perhaps it was beneficial he froze up, a much kinder fate than being torn into pieces by those three, oh, Tartarus. Aphrodite spent much of the wedding basking in the enamored looks of men and women, mortals and gods alike, wherever her beauty went, eyes followed, so when her eyes caught sight of the apple and its message, a beautiful smile took hold of her perfect face. What is this, the fairest? Don't mind if I do. The beautiful one was stopped short of her desires by a stern hand on her wrist, the frown forming deepened further when Aphrodite's purple eyes landed on a set of steely greys. There stood Athena, beautiful even in her distinct form of presentation. Too bad the wise one was too strict for the love dove's taste, or else she could have been a real head turner. What do you think you're doing, Aphrodite? I am taking what is mine as the fairest woman. Hootie, what is it to you? Like most of their large family, there was a turbulent history between the two goddesses, this led to something of a rivalry between beauty and wisdom, fortunately, these spats rarely turned violent, unlike other godly disputes in the family. Zeus and Poseidon Zeus and Hades Hades and Demeter. Hades and Hera Hera and Zeus to name a few, Athena thought to smirk but instead shifted into taking a smirk that leaked false kindness, I think you've heard too many compliments from all the men and animals you've drugged into sleeping with you, if there was one button to push when it came to Aphrodite, matters of love. The only thing keeping Aphrodite from shrieking at the backhanded insult is the wedding festivities, but that didn't stop her vibrant eyes from running a gauntlet of different colors in her fury, I don't drug men or women, and I certainly do not sleep with animals, what would you know about these things, virgin girl? The honorable personification of warfare turned her nose at the tactless insult, Athena chose to be a virgin goddess, so Aphrodite's thoughtless barb carried little weight, you wouldn't know this, but being fair is more than a physical appearance, the one to claim this apple should also know how to act respectably, something you know little about. I agree, Athena, it's why this golden apple was clearly meant for me, the queen of Olympus, Hera looked down and regarded the apple with great interest, she couldn't see a world where this beautiful gift wasn't destined for her, the queen of gods, no matter how one looked at it, Aphrodite and Athena didn't match up to her. Aphrodite's long hair went from a strawberry blonde to a burning red in reaction to her growing anger, 
being backed into a corner by Athena and Hera led Aphrodite to lash out with the issues closest to their hearts, but you are, Hudi? Your second fiddle to Ares, Wargirl, tell me how the fairest can be second best. And you, Hera. If your husband can find his way from another woman's bed, maybe he can tell me how fair you are. Although she was far from happy over the reminder of Ares' growing popularity, Athena bit her tongue and focused on Hera, who she viewed as the more pressing threat, the airhead actually makes a good point, for once, Hera. The icy glare on Hera's face was the nightmare of many, but pride alone prevented Athena and Aphrodite from feeling its full effect, this was a battle that none of them were willing to lose, surely, you don't consider yourself worthy of this apple, Athena, you're but a child born outside the sacred bounds of marriage, abast. Athena was one of her husband's more bearable mistakes, however, Athena was still a bastard and an offense to her marriage with her brother, if the goddess of marriage had it her way, all of Zeus' illegitimate children would be nothing but memories left to wither with time. Unfortunately for Hera, her husband had the final say, and he wouldn't do away with those like Athena, Artemis, and Apollo, so she adapted because, as the queen, she needed to maintain a certain standard of grace, bastards or not. It was best for everyone that Hera's inflammatory remark didn't make it off her lips, instead, the three women devolved into a bitter back and forth argument over who rightfully deserved the glorious golden apple, but by now, their spectacle had drawn the attention of everyone else, the party waited and watched to see what happened next. The discord-rich quarrel built upon itself with every personal attack spoken, with the venomous insults came a gradual rising in divine power that made the other wedding attendees nervous for their own safety, if it weren't for Athena making a remark that satisfied them, Thea wouldn't be more than a smoking crater. We will ask our peers who is the fairest, the winner is the one that will take ownership of the apple, I believe this is a suitable compromise. That was the deal, and it made sense to Hera and Aphrodite, who agreed with their respective nods, to all three of them, there was no way their fellow gods would choose someone else. Fine. Aphrodite's luxurious hair lashed around her body like a whip when she turned on her heel, she isolated and ensnared an ashen-faced Apollo with her expectant stare, her voice chimed with a hint of irritation as she spoke, tell them, Apollo darling. Athena rolled her eyes at Aphrodite's desperate ploy from the pretty one to use her charm, she picked out Hermes, who failed his attempt to escape unnoticed, I expect you will tell us the truth, Hermes, and if he didn't, that glare etched onto her face promised untold amounts of pain. Both sons of Zeus opened their mouths, but fear of reprisal rendered Apollo and Hermes silent as the dead, they were smart enough to know choosing one opened them up to the vengeance of the other two, so the two tricksters tried every stalling tactic they knew in hopes of divine intervention saving them. Poseidon ambled toward his younger brother during the uproar caused by his kin, he watched the pending doom unfold just like Zeus, you'd be wise to do something about this, brother, if you don't act, they will rip Greece into pieces, this matter must be settled here and now. Yes, they will, but that is what Zeus wanted to happen, it was his visions foretold their contest would drag the mortals into a devastating war, the results would shear the growing population of man that rose with the Bronze Age boom, and best of all, Zeus himself couldn't be held responsible when the dust settled, then the real threats to his kingship, his demigod children, would be erased from history. Greece and Troy would be a war for the ages, husband, inform these two why this title is fit for a queen and no other, with that said, even Zeus needed to be careful with his following words, they needed to be fair, if they weren't, people might suspect something was amiss, and Zeus refused to let suspicion taint a plan he had been formulating for decades. Enough. You three will not ruin this wedding. The loud sound of the Thunder King's demand slammed the brakes on the real-time fiasco, now that Zeus had everyone's attention, he simmered down to a normal speaking voice, this was the power of a king, if we are to settle ownership of this apple, it shall be done right, we require someone with no bias toward any of the three claimants, agreed? The uninvolved nodded their heads in agreement. The idea held merit, while most of the gods present exhaled with relief, knowing they wouldn't be subjected to the trio's persecution, Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite all stared at the bearded king, waiting to hear this idea of his, Hermes, there is a simple shepherd in the countryside of Mount Ida, led them there, he shall be the judge, fair and final, his choice shall be the one to claim this golden apple. Right, follow me, please, surprisingly, the three goddesses seemed unbothered that they had been sent off like sheep, no, they were focused on being named the winner and nothing else, it was clear even the divine could fall to the trappings of power. Most returned to the part with the danger of the apple properly quelled, for 90% gathered here, the boons of the grand wedding were enough for them. Left alone for a moment, Zeus freely stared at the golden apple with a shrouded smile tucked into his beard. In the reflective luster of the fruit, the king saw a face, he gazed upon the image of his shepherd, Paris, 
This unassuming man happened to be the hidden prince of Troy and a catalyst of things to come. You have a great destiny ahead of you, Paris, but ill make sure you fulfill your fate, boy. Yes, Paris of Troy would be the tool that culled the bloated, threat ridden Greek world. Off to the side, Poseidon got a good look at his brother's face, what he saw set off all kinds of danger alarms in the Ocean King's head, but this wasn't the time nor place to act on his hunch, just what are you planning, Zeus? After returning home to Greece from his trip east, Naruto was stunned by what happened while he was gone, in recent years, Naruto's home had been swallowed by the flames of war, how one woman was able to start a war that consumed the Greek world still made Naruto's head spin, no matter where he went, they whispered about her, Helen of Troy, the face that launched a thousand ships. Naruto knew that name through word of mouth, some years back, he recalled a contest over who would claim Helen's hand in marriage, it became a hotbed that every Achaean king involved himself in, Naruto himself never looked into the gossip, but evidently, the winner's union with Helen wasn't strong enough to prevent the grip of war. Paris of Troy was the man who eloped with Helen, as if his actions weren't bad enough, somehow, Paris made the theft of a queen worse, under the insincere guise of diplomacy, he made off with Helen while King Menelaus was off burying his dead uncle, Cratius, even the most simple simpleton knew this treachery wouldn't stand. How one man could be this foolish and brazen is beyond me, he must be known retaliation would come, and Menelaus brought the total weight of his fury in response, Menelaus called forth the other Achaean kings to honor the agreement that tied them together during their days as suitors for Helen. Per the terms set before Helen's wedding to Menelaus, Tyndareus of Sparta demanded that every one of his daughter's suitors honor the marriage, no matter who won Helen's hand, they agreed, and so, today, those same men and their armies were gathered in Aulis to do just that. But this wasn't the first expedition to Troy, this date marked the alliance's second attempt at crossing the Aegean to recover Helen. Add this to the list of things Naruto had trouble reconciling, had he really been in the east for eight entire years? Maybe there was some credibility to NYX's constant remarks of time meaning little to immortals like them. Speaking of his godly sister, the vagrant sun god couldn't shake the thought that this was somehow the fault of the Greek gods, the Olympians chief among them, Naruto learned during his time among the mortals that in Greece, one should nt pass events off as chance, no, things occur because of fate, and fate was another word for the will of the divine beings living on Olympus. The only thing keeping Naruto from confirming his suspicions was NYX's disappearance, with his inside source having gone to ground. All Naruto could do was make assumptions based on the partially correct thoughts of the mortals, to this end, the hidden solar sun had to make a crucial choice. He chose war, in Naruto's opinion, he would find the answers to his questions by partaking in this Trojan war, plus, fighting with them was the best way for Naruto to help the mortals stuck in this gruesome game of scorned love, this rationale helped convince the sun god to take up arms against Troy. However, Naruto Omakami knew he couldn't face this battle as a god, he must do battle as a mortal would, he accomplished this by placing a seal on himself, not only would it contain his divinity, but ITD also changed his physical appearance for good measure. The changes in his appearance paid homage to the woman his Ka Chan planned on giving Naruto to before chaos intervened, the sides of Naruto's head were shaved clean, his hair, now a ruby red, was pulled into a single thick braid, which went down to the middle of Naruto's back, and his once bright eyes were now a subtle amethyst that gleamed when the light was low. Naruto's plan to conceal his identity didn't end there, he also applied a seal to Amanonohoko to mask the eye-catching splendor of his ornate polearm, gone were the jewels, traded for a plain aesthetic found in armories across Greece. And while he didn't plan on needing it, Naruto added a failsafe to the seal, which would break it if things went south, a single word would disable everything, Amaterasu. I hate to admit, but you can't create peace without first sowing a field of blood, men want surrender if they believe they can win so as the double-edged sword of hope, Naruto let his thoughts go as he stepped onto the ship responsible for carrying his contingent to Troy, their personal vessel to battle. Naruto saw the high morale among the men, which wasn't surprising to the god in disguise, they were still in the infancy of the conflict, where many didn't know better, Naruto wondered how long these drinking songs and brash promises would last when these summer men got their first taste of war and all its horrible truths. The son of chaos and all the rest had their attention swept away by a commanding voice that emerged from the uniform wave of white noise that had taken hold of the ship, quiet on deck. I said quiet down. I have some things to share with you before we hit open waters. So listen up. I don't want to repeat myself. Tall, broad-shouldered, and set against the sun, whoever this man was, he cut a striking image. My name is Philoctetes, and according to our kings, I am your commander for this great odyssey. They say we are fighting to bring Helen of Troy back to her rightful husband, 
They say we are fighting for the honor of our home. They even say Helen is the world's most beautiful woman to grace this world. His last comment created a desired swell of laughter, further bolstering the morale of the ship bound warriors. Stepping up near the ship's stout figurehead, Philoctetes looked across the whole boat before continuing his rousing speech While I don't know about this woman, I do know that you men are my brothers, together we will win the glory of the gods, or we will die trying. And I plan on living for a long time. Who is with me? Cheers hailed the ship's charismatic commander, getting a satisfied smile from Philoctetes, who turned to face the Aegean Sea. Drop the sails. We can't have the rest of the fleet taking all our glory. As the crowd spread throughout the ship, Naruto shimmied toward the back of the massive warboat. Fewer people gathered here, making it easier for the deity to find a seat, one that gave Naruto enough room to breathe. He had been polishing Amanonahoko for a few minutes when Naruto was joined by a man with short brown hair. You're a spearfighter, eh? I prefer the sword myself, but I can tell if that's a reliable weapon you have there. Naruto wore a meaningful smile that didn't match the ordinary appearance of the weapon sitting across his lap, it is a family heirloom, something I fight to honor every day of my life. Shaking his head, Naruto turned to his company and extended his hand, the name is Naruto, it's a pleasure to meet you. Naruto? That's a strange name. At least it won't be hard to remember. His comment was made in good spirits, hence Naruto's laughing response, I am Artemide, cousin of the great king Agamemnon. While Naruto paid the monks impressive lineage its due respect, the noble-blooded Achaean asked one of the questions eating at him, can I ask why you're taking part in this war, Naruto? I've seen enough men to know when one is free to do as he wishes, you aren't honor bound like me or the others here, so why do you fight? Chaos adoptive son considered the question, Artemide raised a good point, going to war for no reason seemed baffling, if not downright stupid, however, Naruto could go around admitting his origins and purpose, so some creative improvising was called for, it's less a firm explanation and more a feeling in my gut, I feel like I've been called to do something meaningful, which is why I'm here to fight. Yes. The heart of a warrior. It all makes sense. I respect that, there was something similar to approval in the Greek's eyes while he looked at Naruto, that was the courage he wanted in the men fighting by his side, you know, when this Helen business is sorted, you should return to Mycenae with me, I am sure we can find a place for you in my cousin's employ. Naruto purposefully skipped past the offer when he made a rather morbid remark about their future, it was just something he felt deep in his bones, something Naruto felt like he had to say, if we make it through, I have a feeling this is going to be a long war. Naruto had no idea how hauntingly accurate his statement would prove to be. The time Naruto spent on the ship included more than watching the waves, with the guidance of Artemide, who turned out to be second in command, Naruto learned the proper way to wield a copus, and with land in sight, Naruto had a chance to put his new skill set to the test. Currently, they were floating off the shore of some island with some of the men rowing the ship into the nearby bay. Where landing would be much easier on the fighters, it didn't take long before Philoctetes took control of the situation as expected of a leader. Last night's storm pushed us off course. If we want to make it to Tenedo, we will need more supplies. This land here is Chrys Island, an outpost the first expedition discovered eight years earlier. It will have what we need. Philoctet silently motioned for Artemide to take over. Chrys is in bed with the Trojans. If you want food, you'll have to fight for it, boys. Get your weapons ready and stay on your toes. We move on Philoctet's signal. Artemide's words triggered a rush of action among his fellow warriors, who were all too happy to have a chance at battle after these restless months on the ship. The god hidden in their midst positioned himself at the formation center, armed with a copus and standard shield. Naruto linked up with the others around him and formed an unflinching shield wall. At the head of this unit was Philoctetes and his familiar voice, Are you ready? Okay. To the edge of the beach, move as one. A collective sound of armored suits shuffling in unison created a clashing drumbeat that followed the warriors to the precipice, where the sand turned into soil. Upon their leader's hand going up, they held fast, a literal wall of bronze and resolve waiting to be unleashed. Archers, fan out and keep your bows trained on the tree line. Now properly formed up for battle, the Achaean mass looked ready to roll, however, Philoctetes wasn't done there, Artemide, take half the men with you and travel the north path, well move east and hit them from two sides. Artemide faithfully turned his superior's words into action, you heard the man. You thirty are with me. Come on, move your asses. The choice to divide into two even groups was a smart one, a smaller force made traveling the narrow paths a more feasible mission for all involved. Despite keeping a cautious pace, Naruto and company made excellent time, this should be credited to a total lack of opposition, 
the confusion among the force reached its boiling point when the group of 30 reached the partially ajar gates without seeing a single enemy combatant, while their sub-leader motioned for the gates to be opened, Naruto picked up a whisper from someone behind him, I smell smoke. Naruto also detected the stagnant scent of smoke and gripped the handle of his blade in preparation. The smashed wooden gates flung open with a nerve-ruffling creak that was heard for miles, if there was anyone else on the island to experience it. What in Poseidon's name happened here? While he wouldn't have gone so far as to invoke a god's name, he agreed with the sentiment of his pious comrade, what greeted them was nothing short of ruin, buildings were crushed into piles of splinters, and what remained standing was burnt beyond repair. Like Naruto's group before them, Philoctetes and his men marched into a shell resembling civilization, the usually sure man looked as baffled as the rest of them, Naruto's sharp ears heard Philoctetes mumbling under his breath from across the outpost, spread out, salvage whatever you can find. The fire-haired child of Amaterasu singled out a building husk with one and a half walls remaining upright, Naruto carefully shuffled planks and stones aside until he stumbled upon a broken wooden shelf, under that soot-stained timber, he found a shiny bobble. Reaching into the chaotic mess, he wrapped his hand around its spherical shape, Naruto found the smooth item to be cool to the touch, when he pulled back, he held a green gem orb with a thin black line going down its center, it reminded Naruto of, a snake's eye. Philoctetes. The panicked cry resulted in Naruto grabbing his sword and spinning around, that's how Naruto saw Philoctetes, the tall man had a snake dangling from his forearm, its fangs were deep in Philoctetes' olive tanned flesh. The stalwart Achaean was quick to rip the snake away from his arm, throwing the serpent down with a grunt, Philoctetes crushed its head under the sole of his boot, nothing but a flesh wound, don't worry, enemies behind. Try as he might, Heracles' friend couldn't issue his warning in time, the man Philoctetes sought to alert already had his throat ripped out by a pair of savage claws that made short work of his vulnerable flesh, and because it came from behind, the brave man didn't even see his death coming, fates like these were suffered across the surprise battlefield. In the time it took to snap one's fingers, the group of sixty lost ten lives in terrible fashion, the blood not being choked on sprayed from the deadly lacerations until the dying men crumbled to the ground with meek, gurgling coughs until they went silently to the underworld. Two battle-aware warriors nearby grouped on Naruto, counting on more numbers meaning a higher chance of survival against these supernatural predators, soon, one of these two men voiced the question they were all thinking, where in Tartarus did these things come from? A nest of ten snake-like horrors made their grand entrance, slithering from the shadows with rolling hisses, they had these long, flexible bodies typical of a snake, until it came to their tops, where a very human torso sat, including the six-inch dagger claws that dripped with the fresh blood of their victims. What are they? Clang. The conversing pair flinched when the slithering beast's charge was stopped courtesy of Naruto's shield, it moved so fast, they hadn't even seen it move, which only made their nervousness soar. This isn't the time to run your mouths. Get serious, or you're dead. Unlike most, Naruto's godly body had no trouble keeping the monster at arm's length. Naruto's actions delivered his message loud and clear, in one stroke, he rallied the fighting spirit of his allies, they stepped around Naruto to strike the beast from both sides, unfortunately, the man on the left was faster, putting a hitch in what was supposed to be a unified attack, perfect teamwork wasn't easily obtained, no matter what the stories said. That little gap allowed the snake to sweep the warrior's feet from underneath him, on his back, he looked up into the green mouth of the drooling abomination, he was saved from further harm when it hissed out in pain and whipped to its right, that's where the other mon's sword was shoved a quarter into the scaled creature's side, but it wasn't enough to fell the monster. Ripping out with a furious screech, the feral beast swiveled to its blind side, where it lifted its attacker by the throat, sword still buried in its side, just as the narrow-eyed serpent reeled the fearful man toward its venom-leaking maw, the serpentine's arm was cut off at the elbow, this time there was no reaction to the pain, not before Naruto's copus lopped off its head in one slash. Schlick. Ignoring the gushing fountain of corrupted blood pouring onto his frozen allies, Naruto rushed to the nearest fight while the two men on the ground tried to catch their breath. I am alive? My life, it flashed before my eyes, we are alive, thank Athena. Naruto spotted one of his fellow skirmishers engaging with a snake beast in single combat, they had an axe in their hands and a bow settled on their back. Why is it always snakes? He allowed his question to float off as he reached for the disguised spear on his back, personally, Naruto had no issue with the snakes in general, but they had a problem with him, apparently. Shaking off his worthless thought, the ruby-haired god threw the fabled Amanonahoko like a javelin, it sailed through the smoky air like a missile and impaled the snake, trapping it in place, the stubborn serpent didn't die, but it was immobilized by the length of Amanonahoko, 
That opening is all the snake's original opponent needed to pull out his bow and put three arrows into the monster's skull, finishing it for good. Naruto jerked his legacy weapon free from the limp monster's carcass, grunting, Are you hurt? He asked while checking over the bronze-covered marksman, who appeared winded but otherwise okay. No, something about his voice felt wrong, but Naruto had more important things to worry about, like the remaining monsters that were still unleashing havoc on their troops. Good. These things need to go, are you with me? Even if he declined, Naruto threw his shield aside and prepared to launch himself headfirst into the fight if necessary, alone if that's what it took. I am with you, Naruto nodded appreciatively, smirking almost ferally. Good, ill hit the bastards close, and you pick them off from afar. Their first opportunity to back up their words came when a pair of snakes rushed at Naruto, the first serpent didn't make it far before it got sniped by a well-placed arrow, meanwhile, Naruto shot forward when the remaining beast readied a ball of venom, before it could spit the projectile, Naruto's blade went up through the bottom of the snake's jaw and skewered the thing's brain, Naruto held the weapon there for a beat, then pulled his sword loose with a wet squelch. Shit. Only someone with sharp hearing like Naruto would have heard Artemide swear as the man was tackled, the fire-haired godling didn't even need to ask, an arrow was already put in the snake mon's shoulder, making it turn to see a lunging Naruto. The resolute Kami's blood-tinted copus came down in a flash of bronze, cleaving the creature's skull effortlessly and sinking deep enough to cut down between its eyes, instead of celebrating, Naruto heaved his weapon free and checked on his blade mentor. Damn it. Artemide didn't have the chunk missing from his throat like the others, however, he did have a claw mark carved into his stomach, it was deep enough to expose his guts. Artemide, the cousin of Agamemnon, was dead, the god's attempt at paying respects was halted when the bow shooter put his hand on Naruto's shoulder, the battle is over, Naruto glanced up at that comment, he saw all the snakes dead, but by his count, they lost about half the men they came in with. A second look showed Naruto something different, a group of shell-shocked men lost in their own despondence, that's when Naruto realized their leadership for the last few months was missing in action. Why don't you step up? The sudden question forced a blink from Naruto, it was like his ally was in his head or something. I could ask you the same thing, Naruto attempted to reflect the question since he had no desire to lead, unfortunately, he got a stare in response until he eventually did something. Eyes on me. We won the fight, yes, but not without cost, bury the men we lost and gather all the fresh water you can, I hate to say it, but now we've plenty of supplies to last the voyage, when no one moved a muscle, Naruto was forced into a sigh, of course, it wouldn't be that easy. Ready to try again. Naruto added a little extra something to his voice, producing more force and putting forth a sense of strength that the warriors of Greece would instinctively look to for leadership and guidance. What's wrong with you? I thought I was sailing with warriors. Are you going to quit after just one fight? This is a god's damned war. It won't end and says, well be working our asses off for years. If you can't handle this, I might as well bring the dead with me and leave you cowards here, at least they'll be more helpful than a bunch of spineless cravens. Naruto refrained from smiling when he noted the subtle shift in the air, there weren't any shouts or cheers, but the fire in their eyes was enough. If you're done with the pity, let's get to work. Wait, sir. The fire-haired man raised a brow, more curious about the sudden respect than anything else. Well, Philoctetes was hanging from the mon's shoulder, what should we do with Philoctetes? He's alive but won't wake up. Naruto's frown came from his inability to heal the big man suffering from the snake's poison that would require Naruto to release the seal on his powers, which would endanger the entire group, unfortunately, he needed to choose the many over the few in this instance, put him on the boat, maybe they'll have healers in Tenedo that can fix him. The obedient soldier walked off to follow orders, that is when Naruto's new friend placed a hand on his shoulder, it sounds like you're our new boss, congratulations. Tenedo the traditional way of battle is holding us back, with a few small changes, we can change the face of warfare, that's what we need, innovation something different, what Naruto vocalized was but an excerpt from his thoughts, a piece of his efforts to create something superior to the tried and true shield wall. These brave warriors looked to him for leadership, so Naruto put in the extra hours to better prepare himself, first on Naruto's list was learning about tactics and martial command, it took a massive chunk of his personal time, but he got the job done, thankfully, his godliness helped Naruto retain information at an exceptional rate, far better than any mortal could have done in a similar position. He wasn't perfect, but he was more than competent. That's another reason Naruto didn't partake in the celebrations or relax like the others, no, he was in his tent working on his 20th iteration of the phalanx, the redhead felt like this formation had real merit going forward. 
Naruto's ideal formation consisted of a 16 by 16 unit, which wasn't too different from the 10 by 10 currently in use, his most drastic change was how Naruto wanted his men equipped, the god wanted blades replaced with the sarissa, a long pike with a double point, with the reach advantage the first five rows could keep the enemy in place, meanwhile, the other eleven held their spears overhead to protect the phalanx from incoming projectile fire. But using these two-handed tools would require a new type of protection, what if the shield also served as body armor? That's what Naruto was thinking when he sketched a bronze-plated piece of wood worn around the neck, he called it the Telemann, ITD offer protection while freeing the soldiers to use the lengthy sarissa. The phalanx wasn't perfect by any means, there were vulnerable points in the rear and right that needed to be protected, but once those were ironed out, Naruto saw the potential for greatness if the right people were in place. It's a shame I don't have the men or material required to make these changes, at least, not right now. Tucking his plans away for future use, Naruto began stretching out his legs when a familiar face with their trusty bow joined him, so? What's the word around camp? Why haven't we sailed out yet? The men, they're growing antsy with Troy so close. King Agamemnon's hesitance to offer his daughter to Lady Artemis is the reason for the delay, since his first refusal, the winds have been too unpredictable for our ships to sail in, most would have agreed or disagreed with Agamemnon's choice and moved on, Naruto wouldn't be satisfied with that, he wanted to know why there was a need for human sacrifice in the first place, this wasn't Hades they were dealing with, why would the moon goddess want a life? So he asked that very question, why would the moon goddess want a human sacrifice? The way Naruto worded his question made it sound offhanded, made it sound like an inquiry put upon a whim, he hardly expected his brother in arms to have a response almost immediately. Lady Artemis seeks to create a safe place for women, a sanctuary where they can learn to defend themselves. The sudden onset of passion in those words couldn't be faked, and their impact was just as tangible, thus making any hasty backtracking meaningless, or so I've heard the oracles whisper. And with that very obvious slip, the charade was over. Naruto wore an amused smile as he stared down his tense comrade, you can drop the act now, I know you're a woman, I have for a while now, actually. Now identified as a she, the woman released a heavy sigh before doing away with her helmet and shaking her head until dirty blonde hair fell in a shaggy mess at her chin, how long did you know? She asked curiously. Where another might admire the admittedly good looking woman, Naruto just nodded, he was happy to finally have his hunch confirmed, I felt something off about you back at the island. From then, I waited for the right time to raise my suspicions. What's your name? The bright haired maiden seemed at battle with herself before she breathed a second sigh. This time it was much longer and laced with the naked truth My name's Atalanta. Naruto's amethyst eyes widened significantly at the revelation. A credit to the weight Atalanta's name still carried. How could anyone alive in Greece not know about the famous warriors of old? That Atalanta? The Argonaut? That'd explain your skill and composure in battle? Her composure remained intact as Naruto praised her. Atalanta's reaction was limited to the raising of her eyebrow, she lined up her surprise with a question of her own, you aren't wondering how I am alive after about 200 years? This Naruto character was getting stranger by the day. Naruto dismissed her disbelief with a casual wave of his hand, he might be ready to brush the whole ordeal off, but the same couldn't be said for Atalanta. What will you do now that you know the truth? You know as well as I that leadership doesn't want women in the army since it was a woman who started this whole debacle. Once again, Naruto snorted because he wasn't convinced this conflict came from mortal choice, the feeling of divine intervention's responsibility still lingered heavily on his mind, but he could worry about those suspicions later, he needed to sort this out first and foremost, what am I going to do? That's easy, nothing. A few moments go by, and Naruto is on his feet, there's a smirk working its way onto his face hinting at the creation of an idea, one Naruto quite liked, if he were being honest, I take that back, I am going to offer you the chance to be my right hand, the second in command, letting her many talents go would be gross malpractice on Naruto's part as a military commander. So surprised she took a single step back, Atalanta looked at the grinning Naruto in visible shock, were her ears playing tricks on her? Why you're serious? This was everything the former princess wanted but never expected, dreams were called dreams for a reason. Naruto cemented his position with an emphatic nod, his loose smile shifted into a more focused expression befitting a man with military power, your numerous experiences would be tough to beat, with your help, maybe we can ensure our men make it safely back to their families and farms, what do you say? Are you with me, Atalanta of Arcadia? She gazed upon his extended hand for about three seconds before seizing his forearm and shaking his entire arm, it was all Atalanta could do to hide her excitement, command me as you see fit 
and I will bring you victory, I promise. It won't be my victory, it will be our victory, Atalanta, Naruto retook his seat and motioned for the famous Argonaut to do the same, take a seat and tell me your story. And so, the pair of unlikely allies spent hours developing their newly forged bond, one story at a time. Off the Trojan shores the moment of truth finally arrived for Naruto and the rest of the Greek invasion armada, Troy, the enemy stronghold, was finally in sight, and it turned out to be everything Naruto expected and more, there's an air of mystery around the foreign city, further bolstered by the high walls protecting it, in that way, the hidden deity was reminded of Mycenae, it's both fortress and city wrapped in one grand achievement, this won't be an easy task. After months of sailing the open sea and one failed attempt, the great city was finally within their reach, however, a massive Trojan army stood between the Greeks and Troy, and by proxy, Helen, Naruto almost hated to admit it, but a small part of him cried for battle, that section of his soul wanted to jump headfirst into the fight and let everything else fall to the side. Perhaps if he were an ordinary foot soldier, Naruto could do just that, but with men looking to him for leadership, there wasn't time to lose his head, instinct or not, that's when the fire-haired son of Amaterasu noticed something peculiar. Why are we in a holding pattern? And when Naruto asked this question, he meant every ship in the fleet, not his alone, it's like the men on the boats were scared of something he couldn't see. Anytime Naruto needed something, Atalanta was right there to assist him, she took her new responsibilities as his right hand very seriously, just as serious as Naruto took his own, back at Tenedo, there was a prophecy making the rounds, it's Atalanta who had Naruto's answers. Because he positioned himself at the very front of the ship, Atalanta didn't see the rare scowl on Naruto's face as she continued her retelling, they say the first Achaean to walk on land after stepping off a ship will be the first to die. I hate prophecies, Naruto's grumbled gripe clashed against his clenched teeth, feeling a surge of adrenaline pumping through his godly veins, he was spurred into making a choice, someone get me a shield. He got what he wanted quickly, and so the ember-haired warrior took his bronze disc and hurled it into the untouched sand, the thick, metal slab was buried halfway in the loose, golden grains, Naruto furthered his defiance when he climbed onto the top of his ship's figurehead and jumped onto the beach, landing behind the shield. After wrenching his bronze bastion free, two Trojans broke rank and rushed him with nationalistic pride, Naruto battered the first slash thrown at him aside with his shield, the wide opening left by the parry opened Naruto's foe to having his gut pierced by a single thrust. The second man in the unwise pair didn't have it much better, physically superior, Naruto bowled him over with a shield-packed shoulder tackle, he kept his enemy in place with the weight of his bronze protection and drove his crimson-painted copus into the mon's lower abdomen, drawing a guttural groan of agony. He didn't say a word, Naruto just lowered himself into a fighting stance, the sight of a lone warrior standing against the Trojan army sent a deafening roar through the fleet, as men spilled out by the thousands, Naruto allowed himself a smirk. Despite shaking her head at Naruto's straight-ahead approach, there was a faint smile on Atalanta's lips, she, like many others, believed the oracle but seeing her leader running into the teeth of the beast sparked something in her that Atalanta thought she'd lost, it was something that eluded the former princess in her post-Argonaut days. Belief is a simple thing but its motivation makes the impossible possible, it was a precious commodity in that regard. His act of defiance made Atalanta believe, not in this stupid war that came about because of men and their genitals, her trust was in Naruto, turning to the soldiers at her sides, Atalanta gave the order, get your weapons, he's not going in there alone, well be right by his side. Naruto's impromptu heroics drew reactions across the entire fleet, everyone had opinions, but they all felt something because of his courage. One individual grabbed by Naruto's defiance was a man of moderate height and dark hair, he wasn't the most imposing figure, yet he came with a grace draped around him like a shroud, this was Odysseus, the favorite champion of King Agamemnon of Mycenae. The keen brown eyes of Odysseus refused to leave Naruto's back, Odysseus had a storm of thoughts rumbling through his brain, clear as his churned facial expression, this could be problematic, I need a new way to dispose of Protesilaus now, there will be more chances in the future, first, well need a foothold and fast. Odysseus. The champion turned and dropped to a knee as one did in the presence of King Agamemnon, who was adorned in fine golden armor that shone in the late afternoon sun, that warrior has the right idea, rally the men and push for the beach, the Trojans need to be forced back if we're to establish a siege camp, failure is not an option. Right away, my king. The cunning one didn't dare raise his head until he knew Agamemnon was gone, only then did Odysseus sigh as he took hold of his weapon, hardening himself for what came next, he stepped on Trojan soil, wait for me, my lovely Penelope, 
I will fight for as long as it takes to see your sweet face again. Naruto's display of bravery captured the imagination of allies and enemies alike, someone in the latter group was the great warrior Hector of Troy, looking through the ravenous mass of humanity, the dark-skinned man stroked his full beard in thought, he shall do, if that one wishes to be a symbol, he shall be a symbol for their defeat. Troy's favorite son worked his way to Naruto, cutting down Greek opposition by the dozen in the process, it didn't take long for the invaders to learn their lesson and steer clear of Hector, his path was clear, but before he could advance on an unaware Naruto, he needed to save himself from a last second arrow. That's far enough, Trojan, Atalanta placed herself between Naruto and Hector, slinging her longbow over her shoulder and taking up a sword, their encounter gave Naruto the time to finish his opponent and turn about face. Hector shook his head, his rationale for doing this caught Naruto and Atalanta off guard, step aside, I have no interest in you or your sword, I wish to test the red one in single combat, man against man. While Naruto tried getting a measure of the deep-voiced man, Atalanta shared her doubts about his sincerity, are you serious? This is war, you don't get to call for duels just because you feel like it, one against one isn't possible or reasonable. The questioning of his intentions displeased the man, but Hector maintained his poise, this is no trap, you have my word as Prince of Troy that our duel will not be tampered by outside interference, Troy's proclaimed prince was genuine when he made this promise, which shone a light on his noble spirit. Naruto and Atalanta shared a look, with Hector's identity established, this opportunity couldn't be turned down, this go around, Naruto replied for himself, go help the men, minimize losses as best you can, I can handle this. She quickly realized Naruto wouldn't be persuaded otherwise, so instead of questioning him in front of the enemy, she complied, but not without offering a parting word, you better not die. A faint smile twitched into place on Naruto's face, not in your worst nightmares, get going. With their clash all but inevitable, both men took it to a new level of seriousness, an appropriate level of tension filled their bodies as they armed themselves with their preferred blade, the pair looked ready to leap at the other when Hector spoke, what's your name, warrior? Naruto answered with a lunge and the song of his sword cutting through the air, despite being caught off guard, Hector lifted his shield and absorbed the surprise attack. Clang. 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 Bronze grated against bronze, opening the window for Hector's retaliation, the royal came with heavy strikes and savage intentions, but it wasn't power or speed putting Naruto on his back foot. What gave Naruto the most trouble was his foe's unchallenged skill, to a newcomer at sword fighting, like Naruto, it was frustrating that his more seasoned opponent wasn't leaving Naruto an opening, which equated to being stuck on the defensive for the time being. The superficial scrapes building on his arms helped Naruto stay focused amid Hector's return onslaught, pain provided a sense of clarity Naruto needed to best Hector in a dance of blades, and the longer he stayed back, the more Hector pushed his advantage. Naruto did more than protect himself from injury, he used every attack as a chance to learn more about his enemy, soon, Naruto picked up some minor tendencies in Hector's stance and motions. His upper body is perfect, training and good trainers, I assume, but he flips his hips between slashes for more force, if I can impede that, I can crack his defense through offense strategy, his purple eyes flashed as Naruto stepped forward, hitting the inside of Hector's thigh with his knee. Because he couldn't clear his hips, the flow fueling Hector's assault met a cold end, Naruto exploited his surprise and scored a hit above Hector's shield, the cut connected the Trojan's pectorals together as Hector grunted. The blood dribbling down his chest didn't deter Hector from chasing a victory, loading up his back foot, the prince surged forward to impale Naruto on his trusty sword, but the fleet-footed redhead swiveled around Hector, taking the Trojans back in a feat of agility. Naruto smashed the pommel of his guard into the back of Hector's helmet, its effect was immediate on the man, who felt his knees wobble before he dropped to a knee with the world swimming around him, yield, Naruto's voice was as unforgiving as the bronze against the side of Hector's neck. His call for submission shifted into an opening for Hector, making the most of his chance, Hector gathered himself and lashed out, Kicking his sword back, he managed to catch Naruto on the thigh, his comeback stopped there when Naruto smashed the flat side of his copus into the side of the Trojan's head. Clenched teeth caged Naruto's annoyed growl while his free hand tentatively checked the fresh wound on his thigh, his time spent as a healer came in handy here, the god's extensive familiarity with the human body told Naruto there wasn't anything to worry about, thankfully, Hector missed an artery with his desperate attack, a fatal injury that didn't kill would be difficult to explain. I will not yield. Hector roared back into the fight, his bronze sword flew at Naruto from multiple angles with untempered ferocity, however, his passionate heart and possible concussion robbed Hector of his greatest asset. Skill. 
Hector pushed Naruto back because Naruto let him, in reality, Naruto held the advantage. The crisp deafness Hector demonstrated at the onset of their fight was long gone. More gaps emerged in the Trojan's form, leaving him vulnerable to small counters from Naruto. At first, these little nicks and cuts seemed inconsequential, but as the number of injuries grew, Hector slowed because his body couldn't endure the pain. The facade of control Hector clung to ended when Naruto scored a deep laceration across the bicep of Hector's sword arm. As a result, the prince dropped his sword and fell to his knees, physically unable to carry his own body weight. Hector had skill, but Hector didn't have enough power to kill Naruto in one shot. Hector had the training, but Hector didn't have the speed to outmaneuver Naruto. Hector had the advantage to start with, but Naruto was going to have the last laugh. You could have lived, yes, you'd be a prisoner, but alive nonetheless, if you seek death, I can send you there as a warrior, Hector of Troy. Hector didn't grovel for mercy, he took his loss with a glare, the concussed glaze in his eyes diminished the gesture, but Naruto respected the unshakable resolve. Learning from his earlier mistake, Naruto didn't hesitate this time, he swung, intending to decapitate the Trojan nobility. Clemency came in the form of an arrow, which pierced the back of Naruto's shoulder and saved Hector's life. Hector saw the person responsible before Naruto did, and for the first time, Naruto heard fear in Hector's voice, what are you doing here, boy? Run, run away, now. Breaking most of the arrow's shaft from the arrowhead, Naruto whipped around to face the new threat, that's when he saw a smooth-faced kid with an uncanny resemblance to Hector, it didn't take a genius to figure out the connection, that must be his son. No. I need you, father. The battle is lost, but I can't lose you too. While young, the prince's child was smart enough to keep his eyes on Naruto, and more importantly, his bow. Wait, wait, don't hurt him. He's a boy who knows little of war. Hector would have praised his son for his valor had Hector not been terrified that he was about to see his son killed right in front of him. Do you hear me, Scamandrius? I said run. Don't worry, father, I didn't come alone. Upon Scamandrius' signal, a group of four men in heavy armor pushed forward, cursing in his native tongue. Naruto threw his copus into the sand and reached for his spear. The redhead could tell these men were more disciplined than most. Naruto had no choice but to back away from Hector, leaving the father and son free to retreat from the battle. Naruto had more pressing matters to deal with, namely four men armed to the teeth. What will you do now, Achaean? You're all alone. The tense standoff didn't last long before a well-placed arrow struck one of the Trojans in the eye, digging into the space between the soldier's bronze helmet, the unlucky Mon's other eye widened before he fell forward, he was dead before hitting the ground. The other three warriors hadn't fallen to the same surprise attack when they were stabbed from behind, Naruto watched as Atalanta and three men from the ship ran to him, are you alright, boss? Naruto gave his men a reassuring smile, I am fine, this isn't anything a few hours of rest want fix, what's the report? This time his words were directed toward his second in command. We've won the day. Once we scatter what's left of the Trojan forces, we can claim the shoreline as ours. Atalanta only needed one look to make a choice for Naruto. You lot help here, I am taking Naruto to get bandaged. I don't think that's necessary, of course, his words meant little when Atalanta was already dragging him away from the corpse-ridden sands, he had a feeling that he didn't have a choice, but that didn't stop Naruto from trying to stop Atalanta, seriously, I am fine. Shut up. This is what you get for running off to battle on your own like some kind of hero. That's rich coming from you, if she heard his gripe, Atalanta ignored it, the day was won, but the war was just beginning, thanks for watching.